hills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, good afternoon, and welcome one and all to another brilliant afternoon on Safari with Wild Earth TV. My name is Liam Burrow, I'm the uh, naturalist in the driver's seat here on Wendy today, and our highly talented camera operator, the man uh, making the magic happen behind the lens, is uh, the legendary Owen Dell. Uh, so what a way to start our afternoon with this uh, large gentleman uh, behind me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he gave us quite a fright as we were rolling up for your tele-access. But um, before we get uh, involved with, uh, with all that, um, let's just have a little bit of a chat about housekeeping for the afternoon. So um, I'd love to remind you to ask us as many questions as you can as this experience rolls on. You're more than welcome to uh, uh, tag those to us on Twitter under the hashtag Wild Earth. Uh, we'll read those as you're popping them up. Uh, please as well feel free if you are uh, a viewer under the age of 18, your questions are equally valuable. I love chatting to young people. Um, so yeah, kids, any kids questions, please kids questions at wildearth.tv. Um, if you're under the age of 18, pop those questions on. And um, a third option, if you'd like to subscribe on our channel page, you're more than welcome to address questions to us directly there. Yeah, we are here, we are listening. Let's make this as interactive as possible. So Owen, my, Owen and myself were rumbling down uh, Voyatella Axis, planning to head over to Simambili this afternoon, chatting away about our afternoon plans when uh, the, when this trumpet came out of left field, uh, I tell you, Owen and myself both uh, levitated out of our seats. It's like a cartoon. We left behind dotted outlines of our bodies. Um, but yeah, I think we had just uh, not noticed this big guy. Maybe gave him a little bit of a fright. He just gave us a tiny warning and then settled down so beautifully as these uh, larger elephant bulls often do. Uh, Sandra, thanks very much for your comment. Indeed, a beautiful large pachyderm. That is the way I would like to start every afternoon. Feasting on the choicest cuts of greenest grass growing out of the top of a very fertile termite mound. He is a behemoth, probably five tons, early 30s. A big bull. Probably born into this greater Kruger environment in the early 90s, the same time I came into the world. Ribbon is the matriarch and has recently been seen with injuries to her body. Corky was the previous matriarch and is believed to be taken back her status. Intima was born to Ribbon in February 2017 and also enjoys a high ranking. Hart is the next rank down and in June is believed to be the lowest rank, easily recognizable by a floppy left ear. Three brothers, named the Avoca males, arrived in Juma in 2018. This area had recently been vacated by the Birmingham boys. In 2019, they were seen mating with females from both prides and went on to sire cubs with them. The most recognizable lion in this coalition is Dark Mane. Aside from the Dark Mane that gave him his name, he can be recognized by a distinctive limp.
I mentioned in an earlier segment, a very rhythmic uh, sort of business of collecting grass. Um, an elephant, as an individual, usually bends its trunk around clumps of grass and brush, either clockwise or anti-clockwise, uh, creating this green stained ridge on the inside of the trunk on either side, either or. It could arguably said, arguably be said rather, that an elephant is either right or left brained, uh, right or left handed. They also often favor to use one tusk over the other when it comes to uh, stripping bark, that sort of thing. So strong evidence for them uh, being one side dominant. Anyway, while we watch a bit of fascinating behavior from this feeding beast, this gentle giant, let's head over and uh, check what our weather has to say. It seems... Seems like elephants might be the flavor of the afternoon. Now, I went out and actually told Panda, I feel like tracking something today on foot. You know, we've done a lot of nice little segments. And here we've got a very fresh track of what looks like one and at least two elephant bulls, which is a perfect group to track. So I reckon that's initially gonna be our plan. We're gonna set out try and track these guys down on foot. We've got a lovely wind coming into our faces from where they are. So let's see if we can do that. My name is Chris and with me today on camera operations is Panda yet again. And if we look at this trail, definitely I've circled it now just for, you can see it's, okay, this is my track now and then I reversed but it's on top of the game drive tracks of this morning. Probably a bull or two bulls, possibly more. I can't see any other tracks other than these two. Another track there. You can see they're moving down the road. So next step would be to establish where they move into the bush. But for now, the direction is good. We've got the wind coming from them. They might actually have gone into this little, no, here they go. You can see here as well, you can see some some squirrels. He's not actually a dwarf mongoose. That uh, has stepped on top of it. That's not a concern. Dwarf mongoose are active during the whole day. It looks very fresh, very clearly defined direction that way. I don't see anything that indicates that it's not fresh. Right, so we'll just continue walking until we can see where they've headed off. Key aspect is having to look into the grasses for flattened grasses, overlapping grasses facing forward. Obviously keep an eye out. So hopefully we'll be able to keep you updated as to how we progress and teach you a few tricks on how to track animals when it becomes tricky. Elephant is a perfect example to do that. It's gonna be a lot of fun, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Nice, warm, partly cloudy afternoon, but pleasant. It's got a pleasant, pleasant feel to it. In that tree are two carcasses. There's a diker carcass and a water buck. Oh, it's not as graceful as... <laughs> He's a bit hesitant because, well, climbing a tree is not the easiest, but he will get up there eventually. So let's see, there he goes. And look at the power in that. That is a massive 500 pound cat that has just climbed a marula tree and is up in there. How cool is this? I don't know how he's gonna do it, but let's see. Well, you can see the hyenas are far more tolerant of vultures than a lion or leopard would be. Occasionally a hyena will bite sort of a couple of tail feathers out of the back of a vulture, but I've never actually seen them, even once they've caught one, um, actually kill it. Oh, there we go, nearly got him. Right, 
We're going to try and establish. We've lost a trailer. I think they've gone into the bush. Yeah? While we investigate, let's go over to Cedric to say hello. Good afternoon, welcome here to Juma Private Game Reserve in the Sabi Sands. Good afternoon everybody. Uh, my name is Cedric Dold and behind the camera this afternoon we've got Igor, of course, on uh, Rusty. So yes, welcome to our sunset uh, safari. Well, as you can see, I am standing at a mud wallow at this point of time. So why I'm doing this is because it's quite a warm day and it's a nice, nice warm afternoon. And I think that a lot of uh, the animals, like the warthog, of course, that Chris was talking about now, elephants, buffalo, they would love these mud wallows and just to come and wallow inside of these uh, little uh, pans, especially if you've got some nice uh, uh, clayish mud around you. It is ideal. But you know, please send comments, please send your questions in and uh, keep us entertained for this afternoon and hopefully we can keep you entertained as well. But while I'm doing this here now is my whole thing is I'm trying to look carefully for any tracks, first of all, around the pan to see what has been coming around here during uh, the day, as uh, today has been quite a warm day. So I think sometimes you see sometimes water, uh, uh, warthog tracks, buffalo tracks, elephants, maybe it's been around here, but it doesn't seem like this has been disturbed too much today because there's still a lot of, uh, looks like a bit of uh, a green algae that is scattered along the pan itself. So nothing has really been disturbed for uh, at least for about a day um, at this pan. But I'm going to do what I've always thought is a good thing because, you know, they do wallow because to protect their skin from the elements, from the heat, and that and also from the, from the parasites. So I thought, like, always, sometimes what I do, I also grab a little bit of mud, but it's a very clayish. This is a very, very clayish mud that we do have around here. And um, it's also very good for your skin. So many times people will say, yeah, but how do you protect your skin if you don't have any sunscreen, uh, anything for, you know, for the protection? But, you know, you can get something like the devil's thorn. Devil's thorn's got that uh, soapy substances in, in the leaf as well. Um, it can actually help you to protect your skin. But yes, this is what I use. I use, sometimes I use a little bit of uh, mud, just put a little bit of mud. And I'll just go, especially on my cheeks, because my cheeks is a thing that really, really gets uh, burnt uh, during the daytime so just a little bit of that doesn't have too much of bad odor you just make sure that nothing has been urinating or defecating in this mud and just put it on the side so what i do just to because i know that too many times um, my face is always pointing in the looking at the trees looking for birds or anything and it's always really much in the element just a little bit on the cheeks and it's the best thing to use is this mud so i'm just going to double check in this and I think earth, earthly things to me is always the nicest things to use because earthly stuff for me is the, the way to kind of uh, get closer to nature and it's actually amazing. And of course, just a little bit on the nose. There you go. Just to tap it on the nose as well. Okay. There you go. So that is ideal, perfect for the afternoon. And I think I am set. Just want to make sure that it is nicely smeared because I don't want the stuff to go in my mouth. All right, so we are set for today. We are set for this beautiful sunset safari. It is a wonderful day. And I think uh, I'm hoping that today we are going to find fantastic things for you. <laughs> Lisa, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us on the Sunset Safari. How do I know if the animal hasn't defecated in the mud? Uh, at least I don't really know. Uh, but that's why I'm not going to go too deep because I can see around there. There's not too much uh, disturbance or no, no like kind of scat or dung around here. So it looks like it's clean and that's a smell. It's got a very muddy clayish smell to it. It hasn't got really anything else uh, that really kind of uh, brings uh, like uh, or brings my knowledge to something that has um, you know, did its business here. But you never know. Sometimes that could be good. Never know, never know. But yes, I'm going to look for Tlalamba. My mission this afternoon, I think, is a, a good thing. I'm going to head back into that area just uh, behind Gary Dam where um, Liam had Tlalamba and uh, two cubs uh, this morning, I think, on a kill. So what we're going to do, we are going to head into that direction and just going to go scan that area, see if we are lucky. 
Anyway, while we're going to do that, uh, let's head back to Liam while he is with his elephant bulls. So, uh, Owen and myself still sat with our very large elephant bull here on uh, Vuyatela Axis. And we're actually quite keen to get past, but he has stood still quite close to the road. Um, yeah, after he gave us a little bit of a warning for kind of coming around the corner too fast and giving him a fright, um, I'm very much of the opinion that um, he deserves a little bit of extra respect after that. I mean, aviation, they have, um, they have a, term, a term for that. They call it the Live Cowards Club. Um, the implication being that if you are brave in a lot of situations, if you uh, exhibit bravado, you are far more likely to live a short life. And um, I think quite a bit of that translates into dealing with potentially dangerous situations around wildlife. If there is potential for risk, you should be minimizing it wherever possible. It's also uh, just a lot more respectful on the wildlife Treat everything with uh, the kindness and uh, the gentleness that you would hope uh, they would treat you with as well. Oh, I call these elephants gentle giants, and of course they absolutely are, but they have tremendous power. And if you rub one up the wrong way, um, the consequences can be frightening. Hyena and hippo walking side by side terror etched on the expression of little hippo. Look at this last mad dash. Hyena running along beside it. Baby hippo jaws gaping. It's going to make it. It's going to make it. It did it. The baby hippo against all odds. I mentioned in a slightly earlier segment um, that um, the soil on these termite mounds is exceptionally fertile, producing lovely lush grass. And, um, and yeah, he's been feasting on it for a couple of minutes. Linda, thank you for your question this afternoon. You've asked uh, regarding uh, digestive problems for elephants, indigestion. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, Linda, I'm not sure that I've ever been aware of an elephant with indigestion. Um, I know that there are lots of animals in nature that will consume a mineral-rich mud and soil to help uh, settle the stomach and relieve the effects of, of swallowing toxic plants. Um, certainly there are antelope and... Um, and other mammals, monkeys and things that, that do it in uh, rainforest areas. Though I haven't actually witnessed this geophagia, the feeding, of, uh, feeding on of soil in elephants, I have no doubt that it could be possible. Um, a great question. You're exercising my, my creative brain cells here. Thanks, uh, thanks Linda. Now, their digestive system is also quite different to ours in many ways. Um, elephants do not burp, um, and to my knowledge, they do not have the ability to vomit. So I would think um, swallowing something really poisonous could actually be uh, quite bad for them. 
I've never heard of an elephant eating so much of a poisonous substance that it's died, though. Uh, but yeah, certainly they don't have the ability to purge. They can't uh, throw up or burp to relieve gas forwards. Obviously famous for their flatulence out of the back end, though. Uh, producing enough methane gas to power a small car 20 miles every day, or so they say. Oh, nobody liked a match. He is a beautiful big boy. Deb, uh, we have a number of toxic plants in the environment. I'm thinking uh, more around things like the um, the euphorbia. We get a, a it's almost a cactus. It's a sort of a large succulent type plant with uh, cactus-like arms covered in spines. Hack off one of those arms with a machete and it starts to drip this really sort of rich, creamy looking white milky stuff. That's a highly toxic latex. It is fed on by things like black rhino, I believe porcupine in some instances, but to most other wildlife, elephant included, I would believe that would be very toxic. Um, certainly the Tamburti tree as well, that um, is common, common in the Sabi sands. It's fed on by, again, the black rhino, porcupines, a little bit of giraffe here and there, but I have never, ever in all of my days seen an elephant feed on that. Just too toxic. So while Owen and I have very gently tried to negotiate our way past this bull, and I think we're in the safe zone now, um, let's head over to Chris to see if he's had any luck with uh, some Pridelands elephants yet. So the trail has gone into the bush and the road is somewhere there to our north. It's cut in through here. There's nothing here I can really show you. I'm at the moment doing intuitive tracking. Walk as I think the animal would walk where I expect it to go with no actual trail. Every now and then I'll pick up a trail and go back to systemic tracking, try and pick up a trail to confirm. If it's a good trail, we can go back to basic tracking, which means there's a clear trail to follow. Direction is that way. We are in a relatively open area now, but it's getting thicker there, so once we're there, we will be walking a little slower and will obviously be very, very quiet. The wind is coming towards us, so that's good. The sun is behind us, which is even better. So at the moment, the direction they're heading is everything is in our favor. They're not gonna smell us. If we're quiet, they won't hear us. If we're stealthy, they won't see us. And we've got the sun to our backs. Perfect, textbook parameters. Let's go. All Wild Earth Explorers have a chance to join our naturalists in a monthly fireside chat. This is a great way to learn more about our guides, animal characters and wildlife locations. We would love to hear from you as to the topics that interest you the most. Email us your ideas or tweet using the hashtag WildEarth and we will be sure to take them into account when planning our evenings around the fire in the future. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Look at that, look at that, there's a tiny, tiny leopard cub. Karula has given birth overnight. Look at the little guy who just came around the corner. That is incredible, that's probably his first solo kill. Oh, that is wonderful. Oh, and have a look, here comes Osana with the monitor lizard. So Osana, of course, at the same time decided to go climbing up the tree. He's just nearly fallen out of it again. Yeah, look at that, he's running away. The buffalo is chasing Osana at the moment. is if you don't get a trail again. Hi there. Um, sorry, I can just ask. 
them to repeat the name for us. Uh, the question is how do elephants see behind them? Well, the eye is situated far out. Hager, that's your name. Hi there, Hager. So when they walk, they just have to turn their heads slightly. Often when they walk, you see them doing that. So they they just turn the body slightly, and then the eye can get a very very wide view. It's not as they can look at not an elephant. <laughs> Just shows you while tracking creatures you can always bump into something else. Got a giraffe there. Anyway, so they'll constantly turn and look behind them if there's a need to try and see behind them. Generally speaking, they don't like us be behind them when in the car. They want to see us. But on foot we first and foremost try and stay concealed. At times like we've seen with those elephants at the water hole exposing yourself will not really make a difference. Tracking like this, it's stealthy and you want to stay hidden. All right, I want to go over to Cedric and find out how he stays concealed, tracking in a car or on foot. Let's go over to Cedric. Yes, we back. We have uh, just uh, located on uh, on uh, a Um She is in this thicket still under these spike thorns, busy feeding on something. But she's so well camouflaged; it's so difficult. You just see a couple of rosettes that's sticking out, and you can just hear her eating on uh, that kill of hers. As you can see, a couple of rosettes there. She is just feeding around there. So she's really tucked inside this uh, spike thorn. And I think it's amazing that uh, she's uh, dragged it in there. And an ideal little position for her because now um, out of sight for vultures. So now, of course, vultures won't see that at all. And so that won't, if a vulture sees it and the vulture comes down to sit close by, that's just going to attract the next thing, of course, and that's hyenas. So she's really done well, and also the scent of it. I'm just looking at the wind direction, pretty much coming from behind us. And the wind is heading straight towards the lodge area or the camp. And I think she's been fortunate that none of the hyenas have picked up on uh, this kill. So it's fantastic that she has done so, so well. My favorite thing about Wild Earth are the animals and the interaction and the ability to wait and watch and not rush off. You get to watch their behavior and learn about it, the individuals. I would like to see the hyenas at the hyena den, and I have. There they are. Look at that. <laughs> if I could be any animal, I would be a cheetah. I would love to run fast. Our Western Cape coastline is graced with a Cape fur seal. This playful species is curious and entertaining. At Hald Bay Seal Rescue Center, seals in need are rescued, fed, and nursed back to health by our well-trained team of dedicated staff and volunteers. This wonderful legacy of the center is continued as these protected creatures are rehabilitated and released back into the wild. Definitely, as I can see, she's still busy eating on that kill. I'm hoping there is a couple of marulas behind us, marula trees behind us. Um, you never know. Once you start uh, feeding, she might take a little bit of a break, a little bit of a rest somewhere in the shade here, yeah, somewhere. Uh, maybe a little bit more in the open. And I'm sure later on, I'm sure she's just going to think about maybe taking and dragging that kill up to one of these trees, just in case for. Uh, any predators like your hyenas that'll pick up uh, on that scent later. Um, maybe she'll just leave it under here. It, looked, it looks like so far it's well protected, but uh, it would be a good idea if she does take it and hoist it, just for for safety's sake. I just see her because uh, why I say it is her, it's difficult to see it. Oh. Uh, 
Yes, Amy, good afternoon. Uh, she is definitely eating well. And why I say it is her eating, I can just see by the, 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 the rosettes on her at the moment. It's not a, a cub's uh, fur, where it's much furrier or fluffier. Uh, where you can see the mom is still, it's very well um, kind of, uh, I'm going to say, it's like an older coat, which is uh, much smoother. I just see the back of her. I might just uh, try and reposition a little bit further away here to get another angle. But while we try and do that, let's uh, head over to Chris in Pridelands and see what he's up to. Well, we're literally surrounded by giraffe. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven at least. And again, just showing that um, we're tracking elephants. And while doing that, we bumped into these guys. In fact, it showed me that we were walking very stealthy because we literally had one right at this bush that didn't notice us. And then, oh, oh gosh, there's humans, and then it moved a bit further. It's actually that big cow over there. The thing is, you don't want them to run because if the elephants are just behind them, they're going to spook the elephants. The elephants will hear the running and they'll think there's danger and they'll move away as well. Not necessarily elephants alone, but they're tracking. So that's the importance of stealth and proximity. So now our aim is not to view the giraffe. We've got a view of them. We want to stick to the task, track the elephant. The giraffe has calmed it down now. They've seen that we're not a threat. And they are moving. <laughs> it's just something different seeing giraffe on foot. It's almost like... I don't know, it's, you really get a true appreciation of their size and height specifically when you see them on foot. <laughs> if you are a wild earth explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of Explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colours, a very useful tote bag or even a cap. For those in the Southern Hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. Head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. Hukamori. Oh, he is an impressive looking male leopard. Look at that neck on him. He just looks ready for a fight. This is only the third time that we are seeing him that is known as the Hukumuri male. And he certainly has a lot of character and atmosphere. This is gorgeous. Hukumuri having a drink at one of the little seasonal pans. Isn't he absolutely gorgeous? Compact, powerful, focused. She does have a very lovely, nice pattern, like uh, that darkness with that golden stripes in between is really it's unique. Very interesting. Well, let's go over to Liam, who's got a bird who's also got a beautiful pattern of its own. So, certainly a beautiful bird resident. I'm trying not to raise my voice too high so as not to scare him off. This magnificent gentleman is um, a mature male saddle-billed stork. 
They are an uncommon resident in the area. Yeah, quite a special sighting. We have just crossed into the uh, Simbambili property. This is One Eye Pan. This magnificent bird doing a bit of fishing, perhaps looking for an odd frog or two along the way. They're also very opportunistic, so you'll happily take a snake or something as well. Owen giving you a great view on his face and his head. Clearly, uh, well, not not too much um, mystery as to why he's called the saddle build stalk. It comes from that wonderful yellow saddle, and I can tell his gender immediately by looking at his eyes. Vivid yellow eyes for a male. Um, and in breeding plumage, he gets these little yellow wattles. Um, kind of at the base of his bill as well. But a mature male, a female has dark brown eyes. Now I must just tell you, um, the camera does nothing to, to show you scale. Now this bird is extremely tall. He's probably one and a half meters tall when he stands upright. A gigantic stalk. One of my absolute favorites, such a striking bird. They've also got these lovely pink knees and pink patches on their feet. How awesome is that? Dean, very, very similar in plumage. Um, the only um, the only real difference is uh, to the um, to the markings under the wing. Um, so an adult female, or rather an adult male, has uh, these broad black bars under each wing. So it kind of looks like um, like two dark dark black arms when he's viewed from below. A female has something similar but um, it is just just a quite a bit more white. I don't have my bird book with me today. All I've got is my iPhone. I don't really know if um, if we can frame up uh, frame up on that. I'm working with my bird app. Owen's directing me to pop it on the dashboard there. So we'll try and get it hopefully without too much glare. So yeah, it is, it is a little bit difficult. Yeah, it's a, I think it's a little bit tilted towards you. Yeah, it's super reflective in the sun, unfortunately. Yeah, probably not gonna work. I apologize, I'll bring my bird book with me tomorrow. But yeah, the, essentially the detailing um, in terms of plumage, males and females, both black and white like this. Uh, but much finer details uh, below the wings, a little bit like the Batelier in some ways. Um, but fine, fine details. At close range, your best uh, best way of figuring it out is to look at the eye. An absolutely magnificent stalk. A very, very keen eyesight, eyes that have evolved uh, quite forward with quite a downward angle as well in the skull for peering into murky water, spotting amphibians, small crustaceans, uh, lizards, frogs, and fish. Into, into the kill to eat, get their fill in there as well. But they're also going to be told off. See, it's, lions are not great at sharing their food. Okay, guys. 
only just taking frustration out on the other lion, but you see it was interesting. <laughs> So while Owen and I continue to explore this uh, wonderful Simbambili property into the west today, let's head back over to Cedric to see if Klalama has decided to show a little bit more of herself uh, from her bushy lair. Yeah, that is absolutely marvelous that uh, and Liam has found a beautiful saddable stalk. They are absolutely amazing birds. I love them. I just love that beautiful beak of theirs. Well done on the saddable stalk there. But as you can see, we are sitting with a beautiful Niala bull. You can see just at the back of Gauri Dam. So while we're sitting here, I did leave Tlalamba and the two cubs. Uh, it is very difficult visual. Um, hardly actually anything. You'd just see maybe a rosette or two. So we're just gonna give them some space there. I don't want to go and bashing around and putting a vehicle on top of them. Let them rather have their space because it is so thick. And uh, hopefully later on we'll make a turn again there and we'll go and see how, if the visual hasn't uh, improved. But while we sit here, we've got definitely a Nyala bull and, a, and uh, of course a cow or ewe. And uh, what's happening here is you can see the two different colors of uh, male and female. So female is very much like a, a almost a coloration of an impala. We've got that real uh, golden brown color to it. And then of course uh, male niola is very much like a dark chocolate color with those beautiful uh, kind of uh, light brown socks that it's actually got on. Now of course a niola is a, a Shangan word meaning onion. And uh, of course, why they will call it an, an onion or a niola in all of the languages is because of those beautiful white stripes that's running down the sides of the niola uh, female and the niola bull. And of course, it's uh, the whole idea of that is it's uh, just for breaking the outline of their body. So many times you'll find niolas always in these very thick uh, vegetation areas in the drainage lines, just like this one now. And uh, mostly, mostly feeding on, uh, of course, the little forbs that's coming up, or also leaves. So the tambour teas, just like the uh, giraffe. Giraffe loves the tambour tea tree leaves. And same as niolas, and there's a lot of other lovely succulents around here for them. But of course, always in the thick vegetation. And uh, like, the empire, like the kudu, as a part of the Tregolophus family. And Dragolophus means spiraled horns. Uh, Billy, good afternoon. A uh, part of the antelope, so part of the antlers, so antlers, antelope. Um, just that our, uh, our antelope here in, in uh, southern Africa or Africa itself, they do not uh, shed their horns. I uh, know that the deers do, of course, when it comes to their uh, breeding season, but our uh, like a Niola, they, of course, they will keep their horns throughout their lives and it will just continue growing. So, but they are part of the antelope, part of the antler family. Oh, we can see actually the males now dis uh, displaying pretty much a phyloerectus uh, display there where they actually erect their those white hairs on the spine and standing r straight up. Sometimes this male won't do it because of other males around here. I think he's doing it more for a display to the female it's just behind him, so of course you'll look. It's coming to you, pretty much us uh, having their rutting time at this uh, this uh, time of the year. Looking around about as well, May, you know, April, May side. So same as the kudu. So you can see the males just really displaying to the female, and hoping that he can also copulate with her. All Wild Earth Explorers have a chance to join our naturalists in a monthly fireside chat. This is a great way to learn more about our guides, animal characters and wildlife locations. 
We would love to hear from you as to the topics that interest you the most. Email us your ideas or tweet using the hashtag WildEarth and we will be sure to take them into account when planning our evenings around the fire in the future. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Look at that, look at that, there's a tiny, tiny leopard cub. Karula has given birth overnight. Look at the little guy, we just came around the corner. That is incredible, that's probably his first solo kill. Oh, that is wonderful. I oh, have a look, here comes Osana with the monitor lizard. So Osana, of course, at the same time decided to go climbing up the tree. He's just nearly fallen out of it again. Yeah, look at that, he's riding away. The buffalo is chasing Osana at the moment. Uh, v, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us, joining us on our sunset safari. The difference between a kudu and niala, first of all, uh, the kudu is much larger compared to a niala. Um, so niala's, uh, yeah, they haven't really got those long spiraled horns like the male kudu has. I think the male kudu's horns can go up to about a meter and a half, and that is a proper size. It's like, it's max. Uh, we got Niala is maybe just under a meter, uh, the horns as a maximum length. Um, but they do have the same spiraled horns, but um, the kudu's horns looks more like a corkscrew. So if you think about a, 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 a corkscrew that you actually can open a bottle of wine, it's got that real kind of a twirly-whirly uh, look to it, where of course a Niala has got more of the, a horn that's more kind of bent and formed and not as uh, much as a kudus. Just looking at what he's doing now as well. Like, uh, just really displaying, actually kicking the ground a bit there. A lot of display, I think, just for that female that he is following. As well that the kudu is much lighter in grey. So, of course, uh, the kudu's got this really, really uh, light grey colour with the female and the male. They've both got that really, really light grey colour. And, of course, with the niola, it's got this real dark chocolate colour as well as the legs, I've got those real orange legs as well, where the kudu is still grey on its legs. And uh, so yeah, there's just a couple of differences to it um, as well. I mean, it's, it's, uh, the kudu, I think, as well, you must uh, remember that uh, the ears on a kudu is really large. It looks like satellite dishes <laughs> compared to a niola. niola has got a little bit smaller, yeah, and smaller ears on the, on the niola itself. Anyway, while we continue watching these two uh, male displaying it, let's head back to Prime Lens with Chris and see what he's got to do with his tracking. It seems like our trail's getting fresher. Now, we wanted to get up onto this copy. It's actually a few outcrops here to scout with the binoculars if we can't see them up ahead. And would you know, the tracks are right on top here. Just look here. This looks rather fresh. I mean, you can see they definitely had a bit of a dust bath here. You can see how they've, you can see that's, that's been disturbed. You can see their, their footprints here, here. And even there, you can see this, got a lot of definition. Now I need to figure out what they've done from here. It looks like they might have gone up there. So we'll just check this copy. You can even see here on the rock. See that does. That's as they sort of threw them up on themselves. Okay, so I want to go to that outcrop there. I can't see what's down there. And then we'll just check on the other side, on the southern side. I still feel like my feeling tells me they're somewhere around here. But I might be wrong. We've scouted here, no sign, can't see anything. Uh, I know there's at least a road up ahead which we can use to see if they have not crossed and that can put us again onto a fresher track. So let's get to that hill there, or maybe this is closer. First check that side and then from there we'll head to that hill. Take the bins and we'll, we'll scout it. Grass is flattened this way as well. So <laughs> It always amazes me how they, what are they doing on top of these hills? They are easier places. Chef Ben, hi there. 
the shift bin wants to know how do we know how fresh the track is see what I use my stick for if I can look at something it's also to to move air in that case I mean we, we've let that see now but the definition was very clear that's very fine sand they've dust bathed there so this remember the moment you make an imprint soon after that it starts losing definition wind disturbs it and naturally the soil particles will sort of eventually fall away from each other so the definition will get lost as it gets older look for all sorts of animals on top of it but yeah is a sign all right we know they had a dust bath right there in the back and this is what tracking is about is not only looking for the actual footprint any track or sign look at this and that's why i use the stick as well look at this what can we see here i lift it up what is that that is sand that is the same sand that they were standing in there that attached onto the feet and they've walked here yeah we can see it as well so this was done after they were there. There's no way of seeing an elephant track in these rocks. Absolutely no way. But reconstructing the sequence, we know they did a dust bath there. Look at that. That is so, so telltale. The same sand that were there. So we've got a direction. And that's what we want. In the woodlands of Juma lives a lion pride with a taste for buffalo. Look, 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 this is insane. This is what I was saying about lions and buffalo. It's absolute pandemonium. Wild Earth have been privileged to follow the Nkuhuma pride for many years. One of the most loved cats in the pride is Amber Eyes. She was not successful in rearing her first two litter of cubs and was seen as an aunt to the other youngsters. Then eventually, towards the end of August 2019, we found her with four tiny cubs of her own. I'm not going to come too close because I know you've got your babies. And hello you old friend. Isn't she spectacular? Oh look, this is too special. She's such a fantastic mother. Look at that, isn't that incredible? Yeah, and I can't really speak now much. So let's go over to Cedric in the meantime to see what he's got there. Yes, uh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure Chris is going to be lucky with those elephants. Definitely, I'm, I'm sure it's all about perseverance. That's uh, that's the name of the game. So I keep on keep on those tracks. I must say, I'm very keen to find. I know that uh, Liam found these elephants for the afternoon. We actually, uh, Igor and myself were talking earlier about elephants. And uh, it looks like a lot of those big herds that were on Juma over the last uh, few weeks, um, they've just all of a sudden decide to, decided to uh, disappear. I don't know where to, but uh, I'm going to head slowly towards uh, Buffalzook Dam. I'm going to go take a look around the dam area there. Uh, I think I haven't been there for a few days. I'll take a look in that area and then uh, I'll probably make my way around uh, towards uh, Tlalamba a little bit later, hopefully once it starts cool and cooling down, maybe we, we are lucky or something. But yes, I'm on Central going through Giraffe Crossing now and see if we can uh, pick up on anything. I was looking, and looking around for that uh, male giraffe as well this morning, the one that we saw yesterday afternoon, the big boy. He had a bit of a funny injury on his leg. Oh, bye, bye, bye. Just go there, bye. Jeez. <laughs> a bump and a half there. <laughs> Almost fell off.
This is, I think, King, I'm one of those big herds of buffalo, especially that we've had so much good rain around these areas. And I know in the northern area as well, they had very, very good rain. I think uh, definitely missing out on some uh, nice herds that's coming through. So I think the last ones we did have was, uh, and the nice herd that we did have was the ones that came through and towards uh, Biffleswick Dam, towards Hyena Walk. So I might do Hyena Walk, uh, Hyena Walk, uh, Biffleswick Dam, and head around into that, uh, into that direction. Let's see, maybe we've got some uh, buffaloes that will come down at all. My favorite thing about Wild Earth are the animals and the interaction and the ability to wait and watch and not rush off. You get to watch their behavior and learn about it, the individuals. I would like to see the hyenas at the hyena den, and I have. There they are. Look at that. <laughs> If I could be any animal, I would be a cheetah. I would love to run fast. Our Western Cape coastline is graced with a Cape fur seal. This playful species is curious and entertaining. At Hout Bay Seal Rescue Center, seals in need are rescued, fed and nursed back to health by our well-trained team of dedicated staff and volunteers. This wonderful legacy of the center is continued as these protected creatures are rehabilitated and released back into the wild. I think as well that uh, beautiful saddle Sedable chicks, they are uh, not the prettiest of chicks, but uh, that is when they become adults, they are really stunning. But while we carry on on our uh, inner walk, let's head uh, back to Liam. We'll see what's he doing on Simon Billy. So thanks very much, Cedric. Um, our explorations westwards into Simambili this afternoon are uh, already providing uh, some nice sightings. And we've observed that uh, Simambili Dam has now got two or three hippopotamus in it. Um, I think maybe just two. I thought it was a cow, a bull, and a little calf. But I'm now just thinking uh, a female and a youngster. Mum sticking close to her little one. Yeah, hippo movements are incredible out here. Um, and a water hole such as this, holding quite a volume of water, I'm sure, into the dry season, is the perfect refuge for these totally water-dependent animals. Yeah, prime hippo habitat. It's a, a, Owen was just saying, a beautiful little spot. Now our signal is at times a little bit uh, a little bit challenging on this property. We have kind of uh, dark spots where uh, we can't broadcast to you, but it's still always a nice place to explore. It's got some beautifully varied habitats, lots of grassland, a great place to look for plains game, often good for lions. So yeah, we're rolling the dice. Let's see what happens here this afternoon. But it's already turning into an adventure. No regrets. Zoe, a very good question. I would imagine a hippo calf is pretty dependent on its mom for a good year uh, before it's uh, willing to kind of venture off away from her at any any real distance but yeah they're born into a herd structure so uh, often they wander around together in twos or threes and yeah i have on a number of occasions seen a mom out of the water with um, a little calf and a bigger calf a bit like rhino do sometimes 
There are three here. I see nostrils from a bigger bull further back. Hippos capable of holding their breath for uh, up to five minutes, so it has been a, a good while since we've seen them. And quite capable of taking a, a snooze below the surface. Uh, they appear to have a reflex that lifts their head to give them a breath um, when they need one. Imagine that, being able to sleep quite safely in a deep bath. I've spoken in a couple of segments about the drought we went through in 2016-2017. Uh, it really walloped the hippo population in the Greater Kruger. It's so nice to see happy, fat, healthy hippos now. Jane, provided there's enough space, um, hippos and crocs quite happily coexist. I say happily, it's probably more of just sort of keeping a respectful distance from one another. Both have the potential to be quite dangerous to the other. But um, yeah, when the water hole starts to dry up in the dry season and you end up with um, sort of dozens and dozens of hippos in some areas trapped in pools with large crocodiles, oh, tempers can flare. Uh, they reckon an adult hippo could quite easily cut about a three meter crocodile in half with its uh, powerful jaws and sharp teeth. But, on the other hand, a three or four meter crocodile could quite happily kill a year old hippo. So again, I think they prefer to stay out of each other's way if they can. Yeah, hippos are pretty formidable, not to be tangled with, and a crocodile knows that. Babies are also very, very rarely are left on their own. The mom will always be close by. Uh, crocs are not stupid, they, they know these things. So I think uh, while Owen and I plan our next move um, here on this Simba Mealy property, let's head over uh, to Chris to see what he's up to. Wind's going that way. All right, that hill is about three, four hundred meters there. Just after you left me, I got to that hill that I told you I'm going to watch, and we scanned in the distance, and boya, we saw at least one elephant there. All right, there's a wind coming this way, so we're good. I saw a termite mount from above there, relatively close to them at a good distance. So follow me. Don't go anywhere. They're right here. Okay. Quiet there. Quiet. Right over there, you can see there, okay, let's go a little bit lower, okay. There's the termite mount, okay, we want to get on top of the termite mount, it's going to be epic. Come, let's go, let's move. Check for other elephants, keep checking. I can only see one, but we want to be on top of this termite mount. elephants around it looks like a very young bull okay this gives us good cover to get close this is going to be insane stay with us don't go anywhere it's right here I'm gonna get on top here yeah? 
that is going to be the madness. Right. I'm going to ask you guys to just stay at the base, just in terms of noise. Panda's going to come with me. Young bull. Gosh, I need to catch my breath. Yeah, it's when I catch my breath. This was serious, exciting stuff, wasn't it? But now, look, we're safe. We've got the vantage point. Elephant is relaxed, it's calm. I mean, it is a young bull. I'm not worried that the bull like that will give us trouble, but there's no need to go and bother him even further. This is perfect. He's hurt us. If you are a wild earth explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colors, a very useful tote bag, or even a cap. For those in the Southern Hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. Head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. My heart rate has gone up slightly. In fact, it's gone up quite a lot. This elephant is now two meters from us. Okay, we might have to move here. No? Yes. Sorry, my friend, but you're about to push that onto the car. <laughs> you see how cross he was that we didn't want to watch him push the key over. That's why we moved. <laughs> If you want to show your presence, in this case, the elephant don't really know we have. If we were to move around either this way or that way around and show us it's open ground, it might get a fright. The other day when we were at the water hole, we were already there. They could see, hear and smell us as they approached it. They were fine. In that case, no need to go hidden. They know you're there. All right, as long as you get a good distance. In this case, we want to stay as hidden as possible. And even when we extract, now our car is that way, which is fine. But we know there's more elephants there. We don't know where we are, if that is a breeding herd. We have been following two large bulls. That's not a large bull, it's a young bull. Could very well be with a breeding herd. There's nothing behind us, there's nothing that side. I can see more elephants moving in the distance, so we don't want to go that way. Obviously not that way. 
don't want to mess around with breeding herds. So, so with the extraction, we want to go back that way, probably a little bit using the same tomato mount as cover, and then double up back to the car, which is west of us. Well, let's go and see what Liam's up to. At Simon Billy, we're gonna sit and watch this elephant for a little bit. It's a very exciting elephant action uh, on foot there on Pridelands. Chris, I'm jealous, I envy you. Um, that is some stunning stuff. Uh, Owen and myself are, are currently exploring this beautiful uh, Simbambili property. So I've spotted some zebra and some impala off in the distance, so we might go and see them. Yeah, nice to explore a bit of a good area. Yeah, it just makes, uh, makes a nice change. Again, the Sabi Sand is known as a for lots of sort of open space. It's not like East Africa. We, we are known for wooded savanna or woodland savanna. Um, so these big open areas, and if great. If the grazers are there, the uh, Carnivores almost certainly are as well. So quite a nice scene. We've got a, a little dazzle of uh, plain zebra with a tiny foal just taking some time off in the road i think he or she is at an age where she's still very dependent on milk so uh, not much need to do too much grazing at this uh, tiny size let the adults fill their bellies with this lovely lush emerald green grass that she can afford to uh, put her feet up have a nap. Not that she's getting much napping done with those uh, those ox peckers pestering her. Such a cute. Tingana has been affectionately known as the Duke of Juma for many years, but his path to the throne was not an easy one. Mvula was a legend from the south. This is the cat that I'm pretty sure Tingana was sniffing around for. That is Mvula. How exciting is this? Eventually, Mvula lost, but his young son, Quarantine, started to push through from the east. At the beginning of 2018, an intruder arrived. His name was Hukumuri. All Wild Earth Explorers have a chance to join our naturalists in a monthly fireside chat. This is a great way to learn more about our guides, animal characters and wildlife locations. We would love to hear from you as to the topics that interest you the most. Email us your ideas or tweet using the hashtag WildEarth and we will be sure to take them into account when planning our evenings around the fire in the future. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Uh, Tatum, thanks very much for your question there. I don't know if it is as specific as six minutes, but certainly the young of most of the herbivores, um, the impala, wildebeest, uh, zebra, uh, even giraffe, things like that, the youngsters start after an unimaginably short little time. There she is on those lovely knobbly long legs. Um, I witnessed um, a scene in uh, the Thornybush Game Reserve, a bit further north of us here, another beautiful place. Um, just before Christmas time, 
I came around the corner and found two wildebeest cows in the same group, both in labor. Anyway, both of these ladies uh, dropped their calves before our very eyes. I swear to you, not more than 15 seconds, those babies were kicking their legs and trying to stand up. Um, obviously, a lot of their uh, survival ability uh, depends on their ability to stand. Stand quickly and move with the group. Obviously, if a lion or a hyena was to pitch up and that little uh, calf or foal or lamb, whatever it is, is uh, still lying on the ground defenseless, it's going to get eaten. So the youngsters are very uh, precocial, very um, able to sort of get up and sort of be animated and run. Oh, that is so cool. This tiny little foal begging for some milk. It's almost certainly his mum. His or her mum. Yeah, thankfully a product of lovely lush green grass is uh, healthy fat rich milk. A fat and phosphorus which is extremely important for the development of uh, zebra and wildebeest. Interesting that little zebra looks to be feeding on his mother's droppings. It's quite uh, unusual behavior or unusually seen but uh, what it actually entails is uh, that baby understanding that it needs to get positive, healthy bacteria into its gut. Uh, I, I hope I'm getting your name correctly. Chef Ben, I've heard your question. Thank you very much for asking it. Um, there absolutely is. So you can tell the gender of a zebra without looking at its undercarriage, without looking at its reproductive bits. What you need to do is take a good look at the bottom. Uh, so view the zebra from the reverse, from its behind. Um, if you take a look at its two sort of flanks, its butt cheeks essentially, uh, between, betwixt the butt cheeks of the female there's quite a, a broad gap. Um, between which obviously her genitals are. A stallion, the butt cheeks are quite uh, tightly held together. But again, if all else fails, just uh, check the undercarriage. This is such a stunning scene. Oh my goodness. All the oxpeckers fluttering around, that lovely healthy foal. That is superb, kind of getting on the move now. I don't think I've ever met anybody that is disappointed with uh, their first sighting of zebra, especially with a tiny little baby. Look at that, look at that, there's a tiny, tiny leopard cub. Karula has given birth overnight. Look at the little guy who just came around the corner. That is incredible, that's probably his first solo kill. Oh, that is wonderful. And have a look, here comes Osana with the monitor lizard. So Osana, of course, at the same time decided to go climbing up the tree. He's just nearly fallen out of it again. And look at that, he's running away. The buffalo is chasing Osana at the moment. So uh, Owen and I are certainly having a nice afternoon uh, here on Simbambili and we're going to continue with our adventures, our exploration on this side. But let's head over to uh, Cedric to see how his afternoon is going. Over to you, Cedric. 
Yes, I'm so happy for Liam that he's got his uh, zebra sighting. And for Chris, Chris got his elephants as well. Fantastic. What great news so far for such a beautiful sunset safari this afternoon. Well, I'm standing here between a couple of uh, interesting little shrubs, little bushes, but the main thing is these ones that I'm standing next to, yeah, these real round-leafed uh, trees. As you can see, a beautiful round leaf on all these little bushes that's uh, surrounding me. This is known as a round leaf teak, part of the teak family. And as you do know that the, the teak tree, you can really kind of make some nice uh, teak oil, of course, using the roots of the round leaf teak itself. So many times you can use that and actually coat some nice wood, like a varnish, and actually make uh, the wood really stand out with a nice, uh, almost a, a maroon color. Uh, oil. But on top of that now, why they are so small? Uh, they're supposed to be big trees. All these round leaf teaks are supposed to be nice and big, big trees. But at the moment, as you can see, they are very, very, very much like uh, little shrubs. You hardly ever see a big round leaf tree around you. And the reason for that is, I'll just quickly show you here, is the, a couple of branches that has been chewed on already. So of course, elephants Elephants love round leaf uh, teak uh, little branches and what they do, they'll actually snap these little branches off and they'll put them in their mouths and they'll roll them around in their mouths like that, just almost like uh, a, 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 a corn and moving it through, moving it through and what they do, they'll eat pretty much the top layer of the round leaf teak's uh, uh, bark off and actually the cambian layer. So that's a layer that really transports the water, the nutrients up to the leaves back and forth. But they never really grab and eat the leaves. They don't like the leaves as much as the rest of the branch. And you've actually got one that's been really chewed properly here. As you can see, a nice piece, a uh, nice branch. It's actually been really kind of uh, almost bitten through and they really got into this uh, branch itself, completely cleared of any of the bark that's supposed to be coating uh, this branch. So yes, they do get to beautiful sizes, and unfortunately, most of them have been uh, brought down to size by the elephants. Then we've got a nice little fluffy, ferny tree that's just sitting on the side here, on the one side. And of course, a lot of people know this as a toilet paper tree, but it's the real name is called the African weeping wattle. The African weeping wattle, why they call it a toilet paper tree, they are very, very um, soft, these little uh, leaves. Very soft, and it's got a really soft texture to it. So if people always uh, get lost or if they're in the bush and they don't have any of the toilet paper, of course, always say, grab some of these leaves, three, four, five of them, how many plies you want, and you can actually use this as toilet paper. But you must remember, there is a certain acacia tree that we do have around in this area that looks exactly like the round leaf teak, I mean, uh, the African weeping wattle, uh, but they do have little thorns under the leaflets. So you must make sure that you do grab from the correct tree, because if you don't, it is going to be a little bit of a, uh, a sore situation inside the bush. As well as with the African weeping wattle, why they call it the African weeping wattle? Because there's little spittle bugs. They'll actually draw the sap out of the branches and it looks like the tree is weeping, crying. This morning we were driving and suddenly we heard a lot of commotion. I think the wild dogs might have caught an impala then, or the leopard might have caught the impala, and as it was dragging it, the wild dog saw it, started chasing the leopard up into the tree, and then the hyenas came to steal it. But, uh, what an incredible sighting. With the traditional stories I've learned that uh, it does have future and a past. If you follow it, you will never ever go wrong in life. It's very important because it contains, of course, the history background and the knowledge of the bush. In each every family they have so-called a tree or Amarula tree will go there and kneel down and talk to the tree and say, we want success in the family. All right, I'm still going up uh, hyena, uh, hyena walk. 
I'm just thinking about it now. It is, looks like it is the sun is starting to, the sun is starting to coming down. See now, where did the main toilet paper uh, bush uh, arrive? Well, they are indigenous around here, but uh, I'm sure people are using it as a toilet paper. They realized it was nice and soft. Maybe they realized it was a good thing to use instead of uh, uh, normal toilet paper. I don't know. Never know. Uh, you just uh, know that I'm sure a lot of people around the bush knows that uh, something without thorns is first of all a good thing and something that's very soft is another good thing. So I think put in put those two together, Sinek. I'm sure uh, they realized it was a good thing to use as a toilet paper. Could be. All right, I'm just, the sun is going down a bit. I'm just getting a little bit uh, curious on uh, maybe Tlalamba. I'm actually just thinking maybe uh, I wanna actually rather make a turn there once more. I think that's what I'm gonna do. I think I'm rather gonna go and make another turn at uh, Tlalamba just to see if anything has changed and uh, rather see if, uh, uh, if we can get her more in the open area. Maybe she's dragged that kill towards one of those marula trees. I think that would be fantastic if we can get that from her. But, uh, yo. As I heard again, as I said, those Nkuma sub adults, uh, they are on uh, Safari, uh, not Safari, Arethusa Shirley's. I think they're just north of Londa Losey boundary um, from this morning. So they are quite far south uh, west from where we are now. Maybe they might turn around again and turn back this side. But yes, I think the best thing is to we go follow up what's still happening around here. But I'm glad old Chris has got his uh, big old herd of elephants around there at Pridelands. Good old tracking by Chris again. I just want to quickly jump here. Uh, yeah, so since I'm just gonna go and follow up on uh, the lumber and the uh, two month ones. So I just had to quickly give an update there. I just want to let the guys know that I am going to be heading back to Tlalamba and the two cubs and see if they're around. Oh, there's a slender mongoose far ahead. Sorry, we hardly ever get to see a slender. Maybe you would stay on the road for us, please. Stay on the road, stay on the road. Ah, dude. Ribbon is the matriarch and has recently been seen with injuries to her body. Corky was the previous matriarch and is believed to be taken back her status. Intima was born to Ribbon in February 2017 and also enjoys a high ranking. Hart is the next rank down. A name June is believed to be the lowest rank, easily recognizable by a floppy left ear. Three brothers named the Avoca males arrived in Juma in 2018. This area had recently been vacated by the Birmingham boys. In 2019, they were seen mating with females from both prides and went on to sire cubs with them. The most recognizable lion in this coalition is Dark Mane. Aside from the Dark Mane that gave him his name, he can be recognized by a distinctive limp. Oh, it's a little dwarf mongoose as well. All right, uh, well, let's go see a little dwarf. Oh, I love dwarf mongoose. Let's go take a look at them. Well, dwarfies, I love them. I think they're all around this termite mound on the left-hand side. Let's see if we can... Oh, don't cross, no! Damn it. Let's just sit here quickly. They usually pop out sometimes. Let's see if any of them are still left on this termite mound. It looks like most of them ran across the road now. See the one, but the one is yeah. Oh, very, very oh, there they got a whole lot guys across the road now. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. These are little dwarf mongoos. So, yeah, no, they, they looks like it's, this is a very a very shy family of dwarf mongoose. They're usually more relaxed. They're still on the road, 
It's the one or two on the road in front of us. <laughs> uh, looks like they are. All right, so uh, I'll try to get these uh, dwarf mongoose. Looks like a little crested Franklin here as well. But yeah, let's head to, little, to Chris in Pridelands and see what he's busy tracking at this point in time. Well, our elephant has joined its herd and we watched him move away on that termite mount. No need to go closer there. We had a little, that's just a surreal experience. I'm still getting rid of most of the adrenaline still. I live for the stuff. Anyway, we are now on the way westward back to the car, but interesting as we had a brief glimpse of some more elephant bulls which I think was actually the ones we're tracking. I think the ones we saw there was a breeding herd. And they are breaking trees and eating up a storm there. Uh, at the moment, it's, it's not a way to get there. Uh, we're gonna continue westward, see if there's a gap in the drainage there on the other side. We can maybe just get a distant view and just investigate what's happening there. It looks like a couple of big bulls. That might be the cherry on top, don't you think? But in the meantime, we're going to continue westwards. Perhaps we'll take the cargo there. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out when the terrain tells us more as to what our options are. So, yeah, I think reflecting back to that, that was actually such a textbook approach on that Ellie's. We tracked them, we found them, we went up the hill, lost the trail, <laughs> Huggy bear, yeah. Now you are right. I'm not going to go into the stick stuff after elephants. Uh, like I said, I will, I will need to look at the terrain first. If it's not suitable, we're not too far from the car, then perhaps we might consider going there with a the vehicle. But if there is a spot open here, like I said, let's, let's take a look at what the terrain does. The rain always dictates what you are going to do. The ra uh, wind, terrain, the species, the composition of the group, direction of the sun, the position of your sun, time of day, time of year, all these things will determine how you're going to approach an animal, what you do while you track it. I just love this sequence here because we had all the aspects of tracking there. We had a clear trail. Remember the beginning in the, on the road, clear trail. That's basic tracking. We can see the trail. There's no need to look for tracks. That's the trail. There we go. Then we lost the trail. So then we had to revert to intuitive tracking, almost like trying to figure out where does the elephant want to go. If I was the elephant and I was moving there, where would I want to go? So then we lost the trail. All right, what do we have? All right, here's the hills right next to us. Last known direction was towards there, but let's use the hill to see if we can spot them. Found the tracks on top of the hill, gave us another direction, and then next, <coughs> up to the next hill, and obviously we didn't have that on air, but bang, there's the elephants half a mile away in the valley below. The advantage that you have then, being on top of a ridge there, looking down so you can plan your approach. Which is exactly what we did. In that tree are two carcasses. There's a diker carcass and a water buck. Well, it's not as graceful as... <laughs> He's a bit hesitant because, well, climbing a tree is not the easiest, but he will get up there eventually. So let's see, there he goes. And look at the power in that. That is a massive 500 pound cat that has just climbed a marula tree and is up in there. How cool is this? I don't know how he's going to do it, but let's see. See, the hyenas are far more tolerant of vultures than a lion or leopard would be. Occasionally a hyena will bite sort of a couple of tail feathers out of the back of a vulture, but I've never actually seen them, even once they've caught one, um, actually kill it. Oh, there we go, nearly got him. All right, 
we're going to formulate our next move. Let's, in the meantime, head over to Cedric. He's got something drinking. Yes, I'm still slowly making my way back towards uh, where Tlalumba and uh, the two cubs are. So I'm just gonna, we're just coming towards Gary Dam again. Um, so just gonna let you know quickly if uh, if that visual, if there is no visual on there, I'm not gonna hang around there anymore. Um, I'd rather kind of uh, let it be, but I'm just hoping maybe she's dragged the, the carcass towards uh, a tree or she might be lying in the open because it is now getting much cooler. Uh, the sun is just gone a little bit uh, further down. So I just want to double check on them there quickly. But yeah, I'm hoping that it is going to be quite nice for us to see them now. I'm not too sure what they've killed. Uh, apparently I heard uh, she killed an uh, impala. So I'm not 100% uh, on uh, the size of that impala. Uh, and if it is really impala, but uh, I did hear from another guide that uh, uh, that's exactly what she did bring down. So if it's a full grown impala, well, that's, uh, and that is last night, well, I'm sure we will uh, definitely see her here for the next uh, today and tomorrow. Hope, yeah, that's if she does hopefully take and hoist that uh, kill up into a tree. All right, I did see another vehicle in the area, yeah. I think she's coming out. Uh, she is coming out, yeah. And uh, we're just gonna take a, unfortunately, there, uh, there is another vehicle that's just approached us and I see that she is coming down here now. Right, so we've got, we've got her, yeah. Yeah, so we're gonna just gonna move around the corner. There you go. She has come out for us perfectly. What a girl. Lovely, lovely, lovely. There we go. Hey, my girl. Definitely a full belly. Lying down nicely on this too much mud. So it paid off. It just paid off perfectly. So I'm sure maybe, well, I'm sure that two cubs, um, sounds like the one is busy eating on the kill inside of that thicket there. And it looks like she is now resting with that big belly. She's very panting very quickly as well. As many times you'll find it. So, so when it is hot, they do pan quickly, or if their bellies are full, uh, it's just to, of course, uh, digest that protein much quicker, to so pretty much like speeding up the metabolism so it can happen quicker. I think the little one is uh, coming out slowly but surely towards mom. I don't see, it looks like the little male. And I think it looks like he wants, he wants to stalk mom here. Yeah. This could be quite interesting. Let's see what he does. Sorry about the other vehicle. Um, but yeah, see. Oh. Sorry about the other vehicle is busy moving around in the background, but we're just gonna we're just gonna stand very uh, sit very still here and see what happens. Of course, mom is just looking and she, well, the lumber is just resting still next to the mound here. Let's see what this little one's in it. It's looking, it's gonna come in. Ellen, good afternoon. Yes, there is a couple of marula trees not far off from where we are now. That was uh, pretty much what I was hoping for. Hey, look, hello, my boy, coming to mom. A little male. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Now we just need a family photo. Now we just need the, the little girl to pretty much uh, come here. And then we've got a beautiful family photo. Like a portrait for us. Of course, now mommy's busy grooming the little one. It looks male. 
I was making sure it's like coming out in the open. I think being in the, in the thick uh, stuff all the time, I think they just it was uh, too much pressure for all of them being in just in that uh, spike thorn thicket. But now it's uh, beautiful to see. I'm just waiting for the little female cub. Hopefully she will also appear for us. Hyena and Hippo walking side by side. Terror etched on the expression of little Hippo. Look at this last mad dash. Hyena running along beside it. Baby Hippo jaws gaping. It's gonna make it. It's gonna make it. It did it. The baby Hippo against all odds. Yes, of course, good old mother and son bonding a fly, fly, fly. Oh, I don't know, sorry, I didn't get the name there, but yes, the cubs are getting bigger every single day. Definitely, they are really growing to a beautiful side. Oh, sorry, slice, slice. So, <laughs> I thought fly, a slice. Yes, they're definitely, every time these cubs are definitely growing and they are really becoming uh, good looking uh, leopards. I'm getting to that decent size. Sorry, it's just another vehicle that's uh, just pulled up behind us. I don't know where this, oh, I don't know where this female is going to be. But yeah, you know, you see definitely the llama, even the little cub, that's just saying, they've got definitely the Karula genes in them. They've got that little, look at that face of his. I mean, it's just coming th right through from Karula, Tandi, Shadow, all got that typical look on their face, which is uh, very distinctive uh, in this uh, in this tree, uh, family tree. Yeah, it's... Well, one's uh, sitting on top there. Uh, okay, well, the other vehicle is pulling out. Uh, Betty, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us I'm on, on our beautiful sunset safari. Yes, uh, look at the cubs. As soon as uh, you'll find, if the cubs are left alone for a couple of days, and uh, mom's doing the hunting, you'll find many times that that uh, cub will very quickly, or when mom comes back to the cubs, that's the first thing that the cubs want is that bond and then also a nice old groom. And uh, so I don't know how many times per day, but uh, uh, it's just they keep that bond very strong between mom and her offspring. And she just makes sure that they are uh, well upkept and the coat is still very uh, good and clean and there's no real issue with them. So yeah, it depends. I mean, I can't really put an exact number on how many times. But uh, as you just saw, when the cubs do approach mom, she'll quickly give maybe a, maybe three, four, five uh, licks on their coat with that very rough tongue of theirs, and uh, the cub will go and settle. I'm just waiting for that little female cub to come through. All right, while we just sit here with that llama and, uh, the, and the little boy, I'm sure I'm hoping that the little female will start appearing just now. Let's head back to Pridelands and with Chris to see how his elephants are doing. Okay, this is not the same elephant. It's a different bull. It seems like it's only one bull. We actually accidentally encountered him. We didn't track him. We were just moving through this block to, towards the car here. And we were actually trying to get closer to the giraffe. Not sure if you can see it. 
and uh, we heard the elephant and oh, it was right here. <laughs> Little cherry on top. Appears to be another young adult bull. <coughs> Seems to be quite a, a number of them around. I can hear more in the bush. There's definitely more than one. I can hear more to its left, but it's, it's all good. We're far from them. Yeah, there's another one just to its left. Slightly older bull. What a privilege. A lot of our viewers are saying that the elephants and giraffe are all coming out on Brightlands today. Yeah. How amazing is that you just on the way back to the car after an incredible elephant tracking experience and then find more elephants by chance. And that's the thing about trails is that you never know what you're going to expect. I guess it's the same with a vehicle. I think there might be three elephants now. Okay, so there's one young bull here. So one young bull behind the guy there. And I definitely saw one moving further to the left through that red bush willows there. You gotta love it. You just gotta love it. Trails. All Wild Earth Explorers have a chance to join our naturalists in a monthly fireside chat. This is a great way to learn more about our guides, animal characters, and wildlife locations. We would love to hear from you as to the topics that interest you the most. Email us your ideas or tweet using the hashtag WildEarth and we will be sure to take them into account when planning our evenings around the fire in the future. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Look at that, look at that, there's a tiny, tiny leopard cub. Karula has given birth overnight. Look at the little guy, we just came around the corner. That is incredible, that's probably his first solo kill. Oh, that is wonderful. Oh, and have a look, here comes Osana with the monitor lizard. So Osana, of course, at the same time decided to go climbing up the tree. He's just nearly fallen out of it again. And look at that, he's running away. The buffalo is chasing Osana at the moment. actually said this so many times this is my favorite thing in the bushes to do is to watch elephants whether you're on a hill or in a car or you're on foot so much better on foot and he fell into a hole again Well, I know that some of my colleagues at Juma mentioned they're quite jealous of what I'm doing here. I'm actually quite jealous of Cedric because he's got Tlalamba. Let's go see what she's up to. Yes, and she just got up now. I think uh, she wants to go and line the shade there. And of course, the cub is still on the termite mount. So they still, the cub is still on the termite mount at the moment. I think the female cub is just behind us, still in this area where um, they've got the kill. And I think I can hear that the, it sounds like a, a bit of, uh, not crunching, but it sounds like she's kind of working through the, the meat on that impala that they had killed or 
we didn't know them, that she killed last night or this morning. Um, but I'm hoping that uh, Lambda does take that kill into a tree. I really hope she doesn't lose it uh, tonight. Um, but I guess time will tell. I mean, I've seen many a time, many a time. I know that uh, Shadow, uh, Tandy's sister, uh, she was uh, expert at uh, not taking kills into a tree, but actually kind of rather dragging them uh, into uh, thickets, just like what, Tla uh, what Tlalamba did now today. And it, yes, it does pay off sometimes, it does work. It depends on you know, how far that scent is going, it depends on the, the wind direction. And there's a couple of factors to it, but I think she's really done well, yeah, if it hasn't even been located by any of the uh, clan members or the Juma clan members. And she's definitely had a fair share. But you can see she keeps on looking back to where the kill is. Uh, she, I know that she is hearing a little male cubby now. He's also getting curious. I think maybe the sister might be approaching. I don't know, maybe they've got a bit of a view on her son, the sister. That's why typical uh, cub now is like, you know, wants to give his sister some grief now. I don't know, can't, still can't see it at the moment. But of course they can, and he can. So. Yeah, here she comes. Yeah, I think she's slowly, but she's, she's, she's coming. Just taking a look. It's okay, Mom. So let's us, we're going to keep really still here and see if a, a little girl comes out. Okay, unfortunately, there is another vehicle in the sighting at the moment, but yeah, we're all a good distance at the moment, so it um, should be good. See the male cub now. He's like really. He wants like. He's come on, sister. Million, chameleon, million. Uh, the male cub. Yeah. Well, I've I've seen. He's definitely a much braver one at the moment. With uh, when it comes to uh, being around the vehicles, and on top of that, he's also uh, more of the mommy's boy. I think. Yeah. Uh, I've seen him more time times with uh, with Lalamba compared to the daughter but I think that's just his uh, his personality I think he just wants to he likes uh, the attention and he likes mom giving him uh, more attention than the female cub that's yeah the always grow of personality I think the more we see <clears throat> the more we view them and the older they become I think definitely you will see more of that personality coming through and hopefully then we can definitely take a look at, at uh, good old names for them. See, there you go. Typical mommy's boy. My favorite thing about Wild Earth are the animals and the interaction and the ability to wait and watch and not rush off. You get to watch their behavior and learn about it, the individuals. I would like to see the hyenas at the hyena den, and I have. Look at that. First line is graced with a cape fur seal. This playful species is curious and entertaining. At Hout Bay Seal Rescue Center, seals in need are rescued, fed, and nursed back to health by our well-trained team of dedicated staff and volunteers. This wonderful legacy of the center is continued as these protected creatures are rehabilitated and released back into the wild. And now we've got almost a family shot. Almost got a family portrait coming through now. We've got uh, the, the little daughter. There we go. Hey, girl. And the little daughter that's just joined us now. Mom in the middle. And, of course, uh, the little boy uh, right at the back there. Oh, she is so cute. She is so adorable, this little female. And there's a vehicle that is just uh, moving around in the background here now at the moment. And okay. Well, I think the, the, the little boy's decided to maybe, I think he's going to think, oh, well, I want to go and uh, I want to go and see if I can have a bit of that kill. So I think he's now moving slowly back to that, to that bush now. It's mine now. 
You'll find many times uh, leopards, they won't feed, hardly ever feed together, not like lions, eh? They are very solitary cats and individuals. So you'll find one will feed and stop and the next one will go and I'll be back for, but I have seen it before where um, they've had, I think it was, I mean, just think many years ago, which was very interesting, three leopards on one kill, feeding at the same time. I think it was Karula, Karula, Quarantine and Kunyuma, uh, the two boys and, uh, and the mother all feeding, feeding on the kill at the same time. So yeah, that doesn't happen often, but it, of course that's, uh, you can never write nature on rock. I always have to, always do improvise and surprise us. But yes, you know, see little lump and a little daughter really enjoying this shade here from this do not mound. Dino, uh, it is an absolutely fantastic sighting of the lumber and the two cubs. Really, really stunning. Thank you to the to who's bringing out the two cubs right here in the in the open for us. Really, really made it special. Oh, my daughter wants to go and go to mom. It's time for a bit of a groom, maybe, mom. Oh, a toilet break. <laughs> See those ears? They'll finish a little toilet break there. I'm going to lie there now. There we go. Well, so slowly we're getting to that uh, age now. I think they're around about eight months now. Well, not eight months. So slowly but surely coming on to a year. Very soon, once they get to a year, then of course uh, the success rate of surviving is much higher. Um, because, you know, when these little young cubs and moms out hunting, you'll leave them in certain areas, especially in like little drainage lines and uh, like little safe havens for them. But it's always the case in getting to these little ages and they start moving around and playing, uh, to, especially two siblings, and they start chasing each other around or, you know, stalking a, a Franklin or dwarf mongoose, or maybe even a, um, a tree squirrel. Sometimes they're not aware of uh, danger around them, and that could be tricky for them. But it's all a learning curve, and I think uh, Columba has done really well and choosing fantastic spots for them to hide out in it. And that's, that's definitely, oh, I've got a feeling that she's going to bring these two cubs up uh, to adulthood. I'm, really, I'm holding thumbs for that. If you are a wild earth explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colours, a very useful tote bag or even a cap. For those in the southern hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. Head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. Hukamore. Oh, he is an impressive looking male leopard. Look at that neck on him. He just looks ready for a fight. This is only the third time that we are seeing him that is known as the Hukamori male. And he certainly has a lot of character and atmosphere. This is gorgeous. Hukamori having a drink at one of the little seasonal pans. Isn't he absolutely gorgeous? Compact, powerful, focused. I love it. And you can see our mom and daughter just lying in the shade. They're still enjoying it. I think, uh, of course, the little boy, he went to go and feed on the on that kill at this point of time. So they're just really relaxing. And that little girl has got such a curious little face, but very safe here at the moment because it's nice and open. And uh, so in case of anything, it does approach them, they will quickly pick up on that. Female coming back 
All right, I think there's other vehicles coming out. What I want to do, um, I'm going to quickly just go and give you an update. There's another vehicle that's, that's approached here. Yeah. I'm going to make my way out and uh, yeah, let's uh, see if the other guys can start coming in here. Yeah. So because it is quite an open sighting and it's just quite a, a special sighting, we are going to just, uh, of course, start letting and rotating other vehicles coming through. Let's head to Liam and see what he's up to. So, uh, what a wonderful sighting of that uh, Tlalumba female and youngsters. I'm uh, very happy to hear that they came out quite obligingly and gave Cedric a good view. We are now sat with a huge elephant bull underneath uh, two wonderful Balanites trees, uh, Greenthorn Torchwoods. Uh, just before you came to us, we viewed the most interesting behavior with this guy actually ramming into the uh, tree trunk to dislodge fruits so that he can actually eat them. Uh, the fruit is only tiny, it's probably about the size of your thumb. Uh, he's left the fruit, he's on the grass now. I'm very hopeful he'll go back to the tree and give it another thump. Uh, we'll see if he's obliging as well. Yeah, super cool to see an elephant doing stuff like that. Another great big bull. It's always amazed me that he, he can't actually see the fruit on the ground in the grass. Elijah Elephant Magnet. Um, if that was a superpower, I would definitely not say no. Um, but yeah, this, the amazing thing about these Ellie's feeding on little things like fruit, the fruit of these Balanites or the uh, Marula, uh, when that comes into season, the fact that they can't actually see the fruit on the ground uh, boggles my mind. He's uh, sensing fruit with his trunk, sniffing. It's obviously got such a fine sense of smell, uh, many thousands of times stronger than yours or mine. It's actually sniffing the tiny fruits that have been launched from this tree out of the grass and picking up uh, tiny objects with the dexterity of you or me with our thumb and our index finger. Come on, boy, give it another shake. Yeah, elephants serve as a, a real keystone species in this area. Maya, uh, no, I would say no. Um, I don't think they get sick from, from sniffing up dust. They actually have the, uh, the ability to sort of suck up an amount of uh, light sand and dust into that trunk and actually blast it over their head, onto their back, onto their shoulders. You very rarely even hear them sneeze. So, um, so no, I, th I, th I don't think they get uh, problems in their lungs from the dust. Yeah, they uh, are a phenomenal keystone species in this area with regards to seed dispersal. So with a stomach system that is extremely inefficient, about 75% of what they actually are feeding on comes through the other end virtually untouched. Um, he might digest a bit of the fruit that's on the seed, but the seed certainly ends up um, in a pile of nice fertilizer, very obligingly left by him. He's lined up so nicely with the tree, he might, might wallop it again, let's see.
way into into the kill to eat, get their fill in there as well. But they're also going to be told off. See, it's, lions are not great at sharing their food. Okay, guys. We're just taking frustration out on the other lion, but you see, it was interesting. What a tranquil scene. Certainly lowers my blood pressure. Seeing the flapping of those ears, the nice rhythm of that trunk. Oh, total, total peace. Darcy Miller, um, indeed, um, if the eyes um, are the windows to the soul, elephant eyes are uh, some of the nicest windows to look into. Yeah, oh, that deep amber orange color, um, extremely soulful. Lots of uh, emotion and um, and intelligence behind them. Loads of depth. Yeah, it might be a bit of a patience game to see if he's going to thump his head into this tree again. I don't know, he gave it three or four big hits, so it may have shot uh, or shook all of the fruit out of the canopy already. But you never know, he seems to be loving it. He may well give it another go in another minute or two. I'm keen to wait it out. Jamie, certainly. Um, I have seen elephants, um, elephants smaller than him, push down trees larger than that. Um, they get, um, 
or if, if they do intend to push over a large tree, he'll rest his forehead sort of flat on the tree and they begin this incredible like rocking motion, almost developing momentum. And then with one final, after three or four sort of waving pushes of it, uh, they send this incredible shock through and it'll either snap the trunk or just uh, push the entire thing over with all the roots. Uh, very, very, very capable of uprooting that tree if he wanted. But I, th I think this elephant is, um, is aware of the fact that this tree is quite a resource at this time of year, dropping uh, some very tasty fruit. So he's, uh, he's potentially yeah, keen to show a bit more respect to it. Yeah. All Wild Earth Explorers have a chance to join our naturalists in a monthly fireside chat. This is a great way to learn more about our guides, animal characters and wildlife locations. We would love to hear from you as to the topics that interest you the most. Email us your ideas or tweet using the hashtag WildEarth and we will be sure to take them into account when planning our evenings around the fire in the future. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Look at that, look at that, there's a tiny, tiny leopard cub. Karula has given birth overnight. Look at the little guy, we just came around the corner. That is incredible, that's probably his first solo kill. Oh, that is wonderful. Oh, and have a look, here comes Osana with the monitor lizard. So Osana, of course, at the same time decided to go climbing up the tree. He's just nearly fallen out of it again. And look at that, he's running away. The buffalo is chasing Osana at the moment. <laughs> Brilliant. That's what we were waiting for. See if he goes again. No, nope, he's going to use the tree to scratch an itch behind his ear. What a character. Incredible to hear that thud of his uh, colossal head against the trunk. A highly intelligent animal. He understands that if he gives it a wallop, uh, the fruit is provided. So I think um, after that incredible display, and thanks very much for your patience, it was worth waiting for. Let's head over to Chris, who I believe is also a huge fan of elephants. All right, we left, we've left those elephants in exactly the same place. You know, another thing is even when they're relaxed, enjoy them, molt the sighting, but also don't overwhelcome your stay. Try and extract when it's still peaceful. Spend enough time as you want, but it's, it's vital. You don't want to extract from a sighting like that on foot when things go pear-shaped. Then it's all. Then you start thinking under pressure and all these things. So plan your escape, extraction rather not escape, while everything is still peaceful and in harmony. And then you think clearly and you extract we and your guests in relative safety and it's exactly what we did we had a lovely sighting there we close to the car about 100 meters I was just, we can't see those giraffe because i did see them where we were with the elephants they started moving this way actually we went back to the car just dropped all the gear that now i can't see them another thing that i'm hoping we're going to try and set up a nice sunset again there at the dam or somewhere. And there's definitely some buffalo. And see, that's today. Hot day, remember today. So even thin pieces of dung like this will harden very quickly. And you can see this is still relatively soft. See their tracks over here. Heading direction leopard dam. It's not a herd. It's just a... No, no, this is soft. We saw it earlier while tracking the elephants. We came past here. This is close to where we lost the tracks when they went that way. We saw the first elephant there. 
the others were there. Um, and I didn't really, I, I took a mental note, but didn't really pay too much attention to this. So hopefully we can get some more buffalo. That will be even more incredible. In the woodlands of Juma lives a lion pride with a taste for buffalo. Look, 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 this is insane. This is what I was saying about lions and buffalo. It's absolute pandemonium. Wild Earth have been privileged to follow the Nkuhuma pride for many years. One of the most loved cats in the pride is Amber Eyes. She was not successful in rearing her first two litter of cubs and was seen as an aunt to the other youngsters. Then eventually, towards the end of August 2019, we found her with four tiny cubs of her own. I'm not going to come too close because I know you got your babies. And hello you old friend. Isn't she spectacular? Oh look, this is too special. She's such a fantastic mother. Look at that, isn't that incredible? to know if there's any birds that use buffalo dung for their nests. Sure. Theodore, he got me. He definitely got me there. I'm trying to think what... I know hammer cops use mud and sedge and reeds. And I wonder if they won't also add buffalo dung to it. Don't know. Perhaps some swallows we know use those mud nests. I don't know if they supplement buffer done. That is a very interesting topic and I do not have an answer but I am going to find out for you. I'm going to try and find out. Maybe we can ask one of our other naturalists if they know. I do not know to be totally honest with you but I'm going to find out and then I will know. That's how we all learn. All right, let's get back to the car. Let's find out from Cedric if he can answer your question about birds using elephant dung. Yes, welcome back. All right, first of all, we did leave uh, early on. We left Lumber and Cubs because there was another vehicle that came in there, but uh, we are slowly but surely making our way there. We just want to make sure because uh, they are in the open, they were in the open and all that, so it was uh, really nice and we all kept our distance. But as you know, we only allowed uh, two vehicles in that sighting, which is brilliant. It, uh, it's much better that way. Um, uh, unfortunately, the third vehicle came through, so we had to make space there. So. Um, uh, I don't like putting uh, pressure on uh, leopard cubs, lion cubs, wild dog cubs. That's not my my cup of tea. So, but yeah, I'm just making sure that it's going to be open enough there, and there's going to be space for us where uh, just for another vehicle, and no more than two. But on top of that, I heard about Chris's uh, question about uh, is there any bird species that uses elephant dung as nesting material? Um, no, I, can't, I don't know. I know that, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, I think it's a spotted thickney. I'm just saying that, I'm not, if I'm mistaken, because I know there was one of the, if it was a thickney, but it's not a lapwing, but I know it's a thickney, one of the terrestrial birds, where they'll actually use uh, like rhino uh, midden areas. So around a rhino midden, uh, they'll actually use uh, the pieces of grass that's inside of the rhino's dung um, to actually create like a, almost like a bowl shape. But not uh, nothing uh, really, uh, 
uh, prominent but just uh, enough for the eggs not to roll out and uh, I think I've, uh, I've heard of that so maybe they do the same with the elephant dung I'm not too sure but that'll be quite interesting to find that out. I think uh, if anybody, please, if anybody knows anything about that or anybody knows of any bird species that uses uh, dung of an animal as a nesting material, that would be a wunderbar. It'll be wonderful. Merci beaucoup. Well, on that note, do you know of any animals or birds that use rhino or elephant dung as a feeding area? Oh yeah, birds. Yeah, definitely. Yes, you know, hornbills. Yeah, hornbills. There's a lot of animals that uses those dungs as feeding areas. Squirrels, Franklins. It's a lot of birds. A lot of things that will actually scratch open those dung sites for little seeds. Seeds that have have not been uh, digested by elephants, because you know elephants only digest about 30%. 70% gets passed through. So yes, there's uh, a lot of the, a lot of uh, uh, seed-eating animals and birds that will actually use and you know scoop up the, the dung and looking for those grass species. You can imagine elephant eating so many different grasses or a rhino eating so many different grass species and at, all of a sudden you've got so many different kind of seeds inside of that dung and uh, it almost it's like a buffet at one spot. My favorite thing about Wild Earth are the animals and the interaction and the ability to wait and watch and not rush off. You get to watch their behavior and learn about it, the individuals. I would like to see the hyenas at the hyena den, and I have. There they are. Look at that. <laughs> if I could be any animal, I would be a cheetah. I would love to run fast. Our Western Cape coastline is graced with a Cape fur seal. This playful species is curious and entertaining. At Hout Bay Seal Rescue Centre, seals in need are rescued, fed and nursed back to health by our well-trained team of dedicated staff and volunteers. This wonderful legacy of the centre is continued as these protected creatures are rehabilitated and released back into the wild. Oof, this light a beautiful golden light coming through now we are approaching where Tlalamba and the two cubs were so we are just gonna just uh, see what's happening there quickly and uh, pop our nose in there but there is the, uh, the sunset is going to be one of them. Oh, it's going to be amazing sunset again. I think uh, this afternoon, a little bit of cloud cover, so it's going to create that extra ambience around here. Okay. Oh, hello. Let's see uh, if anybody's there. I don't see any vehicles, which is a good thing. Okay. It's double two. Okay. See one. Uh, one there. All right. So it should be fine. We're going to go in that side now. Sorry, the sun. Well, the sun is hitting just that right to rise, and it comes straight into the eyeballs, straight into my eyeballs. Whoa. Okay, let's see what we can get here. I'm just really hoping that she will start dragging that kill very soon. Uh, if she does, that would be really fantastic. Let's see, I think maybe she's gone into thicker stuff here. See if we can get any visual, yeah. I don't look like she's around this side. So we're gonna stop here quickly. Uh, Oriental. Oriental Skyler. Oriental Skyler. Thank you, Kathy Lee. Uh, so the Oriental Skyler will use uh, 
elephant dung. All right, so, okay, we got the little, uh, sorry, oh, sorry about the uh, other vehicle, yeah? Okay, so I'm just gonna try and move away there. I just didn't see this little one next to us here. Okay, so this is a little cyst resting on the termite mound. And you got the, of course, the vivid monkeys, that's alarm calling in the background now. But, um, it's got the cute little face. So of course, that's a little female cub, just enjoying this termite mound. Got a nice little view on top there. And I think she's definitely the king of the castle at the moment, or, the, or I can, can say the queen of the castle. He's definitely right on top of this termite mound. And I think the other female is, uh, I think uh, Tlalamba herself has just gone to be on the kill that's uh, pretty much behind us, but of course out of sight at this point in time. But I can definitely hear her chewing. Okay, so it's, what's nice is it's just, it's just us here on the sighting now, which is fantastic. If you are a wild earth explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colours, a very useful tote bag or even a cap. For those in the southern hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. Head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. My heart rate has gone up slightly. In fact, it's gone up quite a lot. This elephant is now two meters from us. Okay, we might have to move here. No? Yes. Sorry, my friend, but you're about to push that onto the car. You see how cross he was that we didn't want to watch him push the tree over. That's why we moved. <laughs> As you can see, still, still sitting with this beautiful thing. Oh, well, look, we're next to us. Jeez. Oh, okay. Hold on. Sorry. I just saw uh, the Lamba come and approach the vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice, eh? Hey? Hello, mother. Yes. It looks like she's just finished having a good old feed there now. Sorry, I just want to double check my earpiece. Yep, I think... Uh, yeah. I think she just came to investigate as well with all the vivid monkeys. That's busy... Busy going crazy, that side. Of course, and those vivid monkeys are from the Vuyatela Lodge. I think they can see Tlalamba walking up and down. So they are really going crazy and giving that typical alarm calling off. Well, we're trying to see if we're going to try and reposition here. Um, let's head back to Liam and let's, let's see what he's up to. So we are sat here with a really quite a nice scene. We have a business, a very busy Dwarf mongoose enjoying uh, a bit of a sunset from their own private viewing deck. Um, so they've chosen a nice abandoned termite mound as their castle for this evening. But uh, three or four members basking so nicely in the sun, as I say, off on the viewing deck below it. 
And these highly sociable little animals um, are phenomenal to watch. Loads of activity. Uh, run by a fairly strict alpha-based system with a dominant male and a dominant female in charge of reproduction. But then they are communal breeders, so uh, uh, they raise their young as a, as a little family. Everybody pitching in for uh, babysitting, cleaning, feeding duties. Highly successful strategy. And there's loads of them in this group. There must be 15 odd. Uh, they are very small and quite cute. They're only about a foot long, but um, make no mistake, voracious carnivores with uh, a formidable set of teeth. Highly evolved for dispatching uh, venomous scorpions, the odd snake. I'm sure they're partial to the occasional lizard, but uh, predominantly arthropods, insects. Back on the log. I spent a bit of time in the Kalahari recently at a lodge called Tswalu, um, guiding some guests there for about six weeks. Um, and I was thrilled to spend some real quality time with uh, a few uh, groups, a few more uh, gangs of habituated meerkats. I'm a cousin of the mongoose, but also just fascinating little characters to watch. All sorts of little personal dynamics going on and always tons of activity, very rewarding. Evelyn, uh, mongooses do indeed feed on insects. They feed on a mixed diet of uh, small animals like reptiles, uh, the odd little snake, lizards, beetles, scorpions, spiders. Um, I'm sure a juicy locust or a cricket um, would be a very happy meal. And uh, maybe even the odd, uh, the odd frog. I don't think they'd go for toads. There's not much out here that eats our toad species. They're pretty toxic things, but uh, there's lots of juicy frogs around. Tingana has been affectionately known as the Duke of Juma for many years, but his path to the throne was not an easy one. Mvula was a legend from the south. This is the cat that I'm pretty sure Tingana was sniffing around for. That is Mvula. How exciting is this? Eventually, Mvula lost, but his young son, Quarantine, started to push through from the east. At the beginning of 2018, an intruder arrived. His name was Hukumuri. All Wild Earth Explorers have a chance to join our naturalists in a monthly fireside chat. This is a great way to learn more about our guides, animal characters and wildlife locations. We would love to hear from you as to the topics that interest you the most. Email us your ideas or tweet using the hashtag WildEarth and we will be sure to take them into account when planning our evenings around the fire in the future. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature.
So I think um, we may leave this little business of mongoose to enjoy their sunset while we head off in search of other excitement. But speaking of excitement, let's cross over now to Cedric, uh, who I believe is uh, still with the wonderful Tlalamba and uh, youngsters. Hey, welcome. I see uh, this is uh, Tlalamba's uh, little daughter. He's of course just, uh, oh, sorry, there you go. Uh, Tlalamba's daughter is just now still resting on that Termot Mount and uh, I can hear, we've got uh, Tlalamba next to us in this, uh, where the kill is. We can't see her, but we can hear her pulling at that kill and and feeding quite hectically. So I think she's trying to eat as much as possible for now. Also a good thing is, oh, you know, they want to try and, for, she wants to try and finish as much as possible for this time before it gets too dark. And once it gets too dark, um, of course, the risk for them, for their kill being stolen by things like a hyena becomes much more, um, I can say, uh, it's going to be definitely a, a situation that she does not, not want to put herself into. So I think that's why I'm just hoping that once she finishes here, she's going to drag it to a marula tree that is not maybe about, I'll say, 50 meters to the south, southwest of us. And uh, I'm hoping she will take that side. But while she's busy feeding, of course, her daughter is just enjoying just enjoying the, the relaxing side of things here yeah, on this termite mound. A couple of dwarf mongoose as well that's been up and down here, but I'm trying to see if we can find them again. But yeah, no, Liam had a whole family of them, which is fantastic. I uh, do you love dwarf mongoose. I think they are absolutely amazing little creatures. Mm, very sleepy as well. Well, while we just sit here and just to see what's going to happen and play out here, let's head back to Chris in Providence. I think he's got the last bit of sunlight that he wants to show you. Just in time to have that last, last, last little ray of sun disappearing. A couple of Egyptian geese. And this calls for a moment of silence. <clears throat> Beautiful. And Amelia also commented and said the sunset is very beautiful, always beautiful. Yes, Amelia, no matter where you find yourself in Africa, it's always a treasure. Especially like an afternoon like we had today. It's just that perfect opportunity to just so sort of sit back, pour a gin and tonic, well, I'm not gonna have one, but reflect on the day and just really relive those epic moments. 
Look at that, look at that. There's a tiny, tiny leopard cub. Karula has given birth overnight. Look at the little guy who just came around the corner. That is incredible. That's probably his first solo kill. Oh, that is wonderful. I oh, have a look. Here comes Osana with the monitor lizard. So Osana, of course, at the same time decided to go climbing up the tree. He's just nearly fallen out of it again. If look at that. He's running away. The buffalo is chasing Osana at the moment. I'm going to read you a quick poem. It's a very quick one by a fella called Kevin31. A very quick poem. It says, Out on the African plains, I find myself peering a crowd out across the land, waiting for the sun to set here upon the red sands of Africa. Propped aloft my trusty friend Eddie the elephant, he keeps me safe here in the African sun, rather an elephant stand transfixed to watch an African sunset. So I figured out this guy's riding an elephant though. <laughs> so I thought that's a little poem that I found in a book cap. Just thought it had some relevance to the elephants we had earlier. Got the lumber, she's not gonna go and settle down. Got a little male cub that's approaching her again. Oh, beautiful. This is a lovely, such a sunning setting. Look at that, of course, the male cub once again, mommy's boy. Always wants to be the first one to be, to get groomed by mom. There you go. Oh, she sees something. She's taken notice of something. Look behind us. Birds are going crazy there, I don't know why. I heard those uh, blacksmith lapwings going crazy, so sometimes if there's maybe a predator or something that's approaching, that does happen. Oh, here comes a female cub as well, on the other side. So the female, I think mom is just making sure that her two, her two kids are still in good nick and still safe. So I think it's very, very tentative momless. There's a little female cub also approaching, I think. So someone's a, a bit of attention from mom. <laughs> I think the I think the male cub is getting most of the attention these days. But let's see. There you go. You can see they both are really very much relaxed now. Finished feeding. I don't know. I don't think there's much left because she's moved away from that bush now where that kill is. She's moved maybe a good, uh, I'll say... 40, 50 meters away from that bush. I don't know how much meat is left because it was so well hidden. But let's take a look here. Here comes the little daughter. I think that's going to be definitely a family portrait now. Thank you, all three of you. That is now just marvelous seeing all three of them together. Now, she, I want to see what happens here. <laughs> and Elle's like, no, you're not going to take my my spark, my star away yet yeah, at this point of time. I'm enjoying this. Ava, good, uh, good afternoon. Um, a, a, a cub, uh, if you can't set mark, well, it's well, well, it's about for long. First of all, a, a cub doesn't really send mark. Uh, it's just if they become territorial. So you should show your adults, they will start scent marking. That's all the idea of scent marking is to uh, pretty much spray against the bush or you know, scrape their feet. 
um, on the ground and uh, or even calling. But uh, that's usually done by the adults once they become territorial. So if this little female one day gets a little territory and, oh, oh, be gone. And then she gets a little territory and then she can start scent marking. But at this point of time, mom does the scent marking at her territory, to her home. <laughs> She's very bleak with life. He's like, mom, but what about me? Why, do you, why does he get all the attention? And you can see she is a, a grooming little male club. <laughs> Oh, that is funny. Yeah, no. He's definitely a mommy's boy. But it is definitely a beautiful sunset this afternoon. I think the weather really played out very nicely for us today. I think even the sightings have been fantastic. So, yes. and also just uh, don't forget on the 22nd of May, we have got his, uh, we've got a tribute to Hosanna. And of course, it'll be hosted by Tristan at the Fireside Chat. This morning we were driving and suddenly we heard a lot of commotion. I think the wild dogs might have caught an impala then, or the leopard might have caught the impala, and as it was dragging it, the wild dog saw it, started chasing the leopard up into the tree, and then the hyenas came to steal it. But, uh, what an incredible sighting. With the traditional stories of land, that uh, it does have future, and the past. If you follow it, it will never ever go wrong in life. It's very important because it contains, of course, the history background and the knowledge of the bush. In each every family, they have so-called a tree or a ruler tree. We'll go there and kneel down and talk to the tree and say, we want success in the family. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, just a fireside chat once again for the 22nd of May for uh, the tribute to Osana. Uh, please don't miss out on that. It'll be straight after our sunset drive. Uh, once again, it'll be hosted by Tristan. So yeah, please be on the lookout for that. <laughs> you can see old Columbus definitely battling with some flies there. There is a lot of flies around here. I think she's been swiping at a few around. She's just quickly picked up her head, I think, because it uh, uh, looks like a little female cub has just decided to wander here towards the vehicle side. Ali, good afternoon. Yes, thanks for joining us. Definitely it is special just seeing them so relaxed. That's why I always believe that, uh, as I said earlier, I'd rather just uh, can give them that space and... Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, then you get the best out of them, you know. And now they don't even notice that we are here. And especially the little female cub, you know. She is the one that's a little bit tentative with the vehicles. Um, and not too comfortable, but she is fantastic now. So uh, it just shows you. She doesn't, even, she doesn't even look at us anymore. She's giving us the cold shoulder now. Mm. Oh, look at that look. All right. Yeah. Talking about you. Yes. Where are you off to, madam? Hmm? Was, especially at this age, we're starting to become very inquisitive about their surroundings. As I said, sometimes you'll find, even if it's a Franklin around here or dwarf mongoose, you'll find that these cubs at this age will start uh, taking interest and start to slowly but surely start honing on their stalking skills and... Uh, how to go about, uh, how, how to go about it. <laughs> oh, a lot of birds here. So we're talking about Franklins. Look, at, look, 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 look. Oh, it's gonna go for the Franklin. Oh. <laughs> As we're talking about it, look. Let's go straight for those Franklins, our little one. 
Watch, watch, get it, guys. Watch, watch, watch. Where is it, Mom? Where is it? Watch. Oh. <laughs> Oh, that is just wonderful. That's exactly what I was just explaining that now, and it just shows you. That was absolutely amazing. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, definitely, she's she's uh, she's definitely owning on her skills. Eh? Good on you, girl. Good on you. That's always a good thing to see. I think even mom, even old Lama is like, yes, that's it, my daughter, that's it. And the boy's like, oh, 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 I don't know what to do. What must I do? Where's my sister? How can I go about this now? <laughs> that is just wonderful. I think he's looking for his sister now. A little male still just on the side. Anyway, well, uh, continue just watching these three. Let's head to Liam. I think he's enjoying one of the dams. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, what an impressive sighting of Tlalamba and Cubs. Very, very cool. And nice to see them uh, a little bit more exposed. Um, Owen and myself have found ourselves um, here on the wall at Treehouse Dam. Uh, the scene where that incredible drama between the, uh, the wild dog and that uh, unfortunate male impala took place yesterday. And those two, two different scenes yesterday and today, like night and day. Today, just, uh, just peaceful down here. Not a whole lot going on, some beautiful light as the sun sinks below the horizon. Uh, but peace and tranquility. Now oh, we're also taking the opportunity set up here on the dam wall to have a bit of a listen for alarm calls. Perhaps the sound of vivid monkeys or uh, impala shouting their displeasure at some predator. Uh, but even if we don't get any of that, it's just nice to, nice to enjoy. Ribbon is the matriarch and has recently been seen with injuries to her body. Corky was the previous matriarch and is believed to be taken back her status. Intima was born to Ribbon in February 2017 and also enjoys a high ranking. Hart is the next rank down. and named June is believed to be the lowest rank, easily recognizable by a floppy left ear. Three brothers, named the Avoca males, arrived in Juma in 2018. This area had recently been vacated by the Birmingham boys. In 2019, they were seen mating with females from both prides and went on to sire cubs with them. The most recognizable lion in this coalition is Dark Mane. Aside from the Dark Mane that gave him his name, he can be recognized by a distinctive limp. coming down. So I'm not sure which member of the uh, Juma clan at this kind of distance that would be, but uh, coming down to check what's happening at the dam to see if by chance there's another impala available. Uh, 
I think we may head back over to Chris to check in with him. I'm sure pretty soon uh, Prydlins will be saying goodbye to us with uh, the sun about to set. Right, they might fly. I'm not sure if our light is good enough, but there's crested franklins roosting in a tree. Now, they're mostly known to roost on the ground. And I've actually, some of my family members have told me that these guys sleep on the ground. And I've told them, I have seen these guys sleep in trees. I've seen them in low-lying trees at night. There is conclusive proof. They've moved up. There's nothing here that's alarming them. They're not alarming. They're sitting close to each other, as opposed to the Swainson's Spurfell, the Bosveld Visant in Afrikaans, who regularly roost in trees. So these guys do roost in trees as well. I've seen them roost on the ground. I've seen them roost in small low-lying trees. Conclusive, but it's not common seen. There's even some guys that says that's the fundamental difference, one of the differences between Spurfells and Franklins. Remember at one stage they were named the same, but that is not the reason why. There's genetic differences, that's why. They're very close relatives. Crested Franklin, Bospatrice, sleeping in a tree. They're going to roost there tonight. It's not something you see often, though. And like a whole little family, it's probably mom and dad and a couple of sub-adults. In that tree are two carcasses. There's a diker carcass and a water buck. Well, it's not as graceful as... <laughs> He's a bit hesitant because, well, climbing a tree is not the easiest, but he will get up there eventually. So let's see, there he goes. And look at the power in that. That is a massive 500 pound cat that has just climbed the marula tree and is up in there. How cool is this? I don't know how he's gonna do it, but let's see. Well, you can see the hyenas are far more tolerant of vultures than a lion or leopard would be. Occasionally a hyena will bite sort of a couple of tail feathers out of the back of a vulture, but I've never actually seen them, even once they've caught one, um, actually kill it. Oh, there we go, nearly got him. They're definitely up there to roost. You can see how they're cleaning themselves, they're relaxed. If they were up there because something chased them up, they would have been alarm calls like quirr, quirr, quirr. All right, well, let's go to another animal that often climbs trees with Cedric. Yes, well, I'm still here. Oh, just hearing a hyena calling, whooping, uh, maybe a little bit towards quarantine area. But yeah, still sitting with old Tlumba and uh, male cub. They're still just enjoying it. Of course, that little female cub went running after Franklin. She's still searching for those Franklins. Uh, she's definitely, uh, she, she's not giving up on that. Uh, she went far down. I mean, I'm talking about, uh, I think uh, you'll see, she's now way down on the other side of this clearing. 
And she was chasing those uh, Natal Franklins and uh, giving those uh, poor birds some grief. Yeah, she's, you can just see her head. And she's still just looking around for them. <laughs> oh, what a little star. Yeah. But yeah, just, oh. I'm sitting back here with Columba and uh, Mommy's boy. You can see that the bond is really strong between the two of them. Mac, good evening. Yes, definitely. It's a girl that's testing mom's patience dramatically. I think uh, so much, but uh, at least uh, the little boy is always back at mom first and getting his uh, little bit of uh, loving from mom. <laughs> like, catching flies as well. Oh, what a special moment between mom and uh, mom and son. But yeah, this, the, the light is busy fading now and. Uh, of course, once uh, we start losing this ambient light, we will make uh, our way out so we don't uh, sit with them while it's dark. So we're just going to give it a, a last few more minutes with the, this beautiful family. I think he's hearing this Franklin that's in the tree uh, to the, straight ahead of us, but I think he's in the it sounds like it's him. Let's see where he's off to, but he's definitely heading towards this quarry. Looks like a quarry bush and a weeping wattle. I think he's looking for that Franklin that's busy calling inside there. But definitely, not like his sister. His sister's definitely, she's got more. She's got a little bit more kind of energy than this uh, the little boy. I think he's up oh, there. He's gone in. He's gone inside there. I'm sure you'll see this Franklin or the spur file. I'm sure he'll just come darting out here now. Oh, oh there. <laughs> there goes the, there goes the, the spur file. Oh, there goes the little male cub that is. Uh, He's a little bit of uh, playtime. Okay, well, he's in there somewhere. He's in there somewhere. And of course. And I just want to see what the uh, llama is going to be up to for the night. Um, as I said, I'm not too sure how much kill or how much uh, meat is remaining on that kill of hers. Um, I don't know. She's, I mean, she's moved about 50, 50 meters away from that bush where she had the kill. I don't know if she's moved away and not wanting to be in that thicket and be surprised by another predator. That's why she's moved more in the open clearing and uh, still keeping an eye on where that kill is. Rosemary, good evening. Yes, thanks for joining us on uh, our Sunset Safari. It is, is uh, leopards are absolutely gorgeous. Wow. It's a sand. It's uh, it's uh, it's an animal that I'll never get tired of. It's I can see thousands and thousands and thousands of them, but it's every time to me, no matter how the sighting is and what he's playing out, it's always just so special, really, really special for us. And I'm so glad that we can share it with everybody at home or wherever you are watching. And we're gonna have these special moments. Hyena and hippo walking side by side. Terror etched on the expression of little hippo. Look at this last mad dash. Hyena running along beside it. Baby hippo jaws gaping, it's gonna make it. It's gonna make it. It did it. The baby hippo against all odds.
All right, so we're going to spend the last little uh, minute or two here, and then we've got to uh, make our way out. Is it, uh, we are losing a little bit of the ambient light now. I think we're just going to pay our last little bit of uh, uh, good night respect to Tlalamba. Well, we enjoy the last couple of seconds here with Tlalamba. Hopefully we see you tomorrow again with the two youngsters. Let's head over to Chris. And I think he's got some spectacular view to show you. Well, the sun is done, but there's still that beautiful background light there, and which is a perfect time to admire the silhouette of some of these trees. And I, this is something that I have a particular interest in since I, I just got something for bonsai trees, which is, you know, I always take inspiration from natural trees in order to try and make them. I'm not very good at it. I'm actually horrible at it. I'd rather buy them, but... <laughs> But just look at that, you know. And there's so many things that's caused the shape of this marula tree. Branches being broken by elephants. That changes the growth path of the branch, changes the shape. Sacrificial branches lower on, which fell off. Olivia, yes, I, I'd agree with you 400% that the best sunsets in the world are in Africa. There's just something about it. You know, if I look at trees like this in a background like this, it's a, it's a natural art form. And I love doing photography on these type of scenes. But it just makes me think, is it really my art when I photograph this? Or is it nature's art that I just merely capture on a piece of paper? This is really pretty. Lady M says, wowza, beautiful sunset. Here's a pearl spotted outlet that are also making their presence known there in the background. All Wild Earth Explorers have a chance to join our naturalists in a monthly fireside chat. This is a great way to learn more about our guides, animal characters and wildlife locations. We would love to hear from you as to the topics that interest you the most. Email us your ideas or tweet using the hashtag Wild Earth and we will be sure to take them into account when planning our evenings around the fire in the future. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Look at that, look at that, there's a tiny, tiny leopard cub. Karula has given birth overnight. Look at the little guy who just came around the corner. That is incredible, that's probably his first solo kill. Oh, that is wonderful. I oh, have a look, here comes Osana with the monitor lizard. So Osana, of course, at the same time decided to go climbing up the tree. He's just nearly fallen out of it again. Look at that, he's riding away. The buffalo is chasing Osana at the moment. Amazing how those purples on top start developing. You've got this beautiful red and then on top the purples. I just love how these colors change. Darkman Lover says, Brighton just got the most beautiful intense sunset. 
Yeah, no, we've had so many comments about it. We say it every day, and I agree again. I just love how the colors keeps changing. It's literally in front of your eyes. All right, that's about what we can do with the light. So let's head over to Liam, who's on a bumble. Straight and right. So, um, thanks, Chris. Uh, we are bumbling indeed. Just crossing the Molawati drainage line, uh, headed for Inyala Road. Such a nice time of the evening. All the birds starting to settle, and with some luck, a bit of nocturnal life getting uh, out and about. It's chilly again this evening. It'll be interesting to to see what effect that has on uh, general nocturnal stuff. Night jars, scrub hairs. And um, yeah, just see what's out and about. This is a beautiful road that runs sort of parallel to the Molawati. The possibilities are endless. Bit of an elephant roadblock in the road, some potholes and a bit of a log. But Wendy making short work. Just reflecting on what an exciting day it's been. Um, juvenile crocodiles, leopard uh, cubs, hyena youngsters, lots of ellies, cool elephant behavior. Leopards again this afternoon. It's a tough life here in the Sabi Sands. Giraffe, oh lovely. Owen has just pointed out a big black giraffe, a giraffe, <laughs> a kind of uh, Samantha, you've asked, do we have any endangered insects? I'm probably going to have to give that some thought, not immediately off the top of my mind, can I... Um, can I think of any endangered insect in the Sabi Sands? Owen says he wishes the mosquitoes would be endangered, and I think um, I think I agree with that one. We've got a lovely big giraffe, big old black bull, just out in the open there. Nice to see him in this dusk light. Um, Samantha, no, I don't think we've got any endangered uh, insect species. Um, the Hoodsprate area does have an endangered arachnid, though, um, the golden brown baboon spider. Um, limited to something like 130 square kilometers, it's the only population of them in the entire world, totally endemic, a glorious uh, baboon spider, so t sort of tarantula family, old world tarantulas. Um, yeah, it's actually a criminal offence to dig one out of its burrow or to damage a burrow. So with a lot of the construction now going around with housing developments popping up all over the Hoodsprat area, um, teams are now brought in to relocate these spiders if they are found. So you have to carve out about a cubic meter of soil around uh, the burrow, which goes into the earth. And the entire thing is picked up, put in a special container. Must be a real mission. And uh, taken somewhere else, they cut a big hole in the ground and uh, place the burrow and the spider all together. 
and back in the ground safely. They can only make one burrow, so if you destroy the home, the spider dies. Yeah, a great question. That got my uh, wildlife mental juices flowing. But anyway, back to uh, this lovely big, big black giraffe bull. Just stood out in the open. He was sort of feeding. I see him chewing the cud quite nicely there. Stopping for a listen. He'll probably be on his way shortly. So giraffe, like uh, like most other ruminants, a four-chambered stomach. Lucas, um, giraffes don't feed on grass at all. Um, they are exclusive browsers, feeding only on leaves and shoots. And they're famous for feeding on uh, acacia trees. Uh, but they'll nibble on a vast variety of others as well. Lots of palatable leaf types, but uh, no grass at all. I'm hearing a, a comment that... Um, I'm hearing a comment that the Brenton blue butterfly and the monarch butterfly are other endangered insects. Um, now, the African monarch, um, to my knowledge, is not endangered. Um, it's been renamed to the common plain tiger. Um, I don't believe that's an endangered species. I've actually never heard of the Brenton blue. I'm going to have to look that up. I don't know if it's African. Um, the monarch that is found in the northern hemisphere is certainly an endangered species or a threatened species at least. Um, thanks for the info. My favorite thing about Wild Earth are the animals and the interaction and the ability to wait and watch and not rush off. You get to watch their behavior and learn about it, the individuals. I would like to see the hyenas at the hyena den, and I have. There they are. Look at that. <laughs> if I could be any animal, I would be a cheetah. I would love to run fast. Our Western Cape coastline is graced with a Cape fur seal. This playful species is curious and entertaining. At Hald Bay Seal Rescue Centre, seals in need are rescued, fed and nursed back to health by our well-trained team of dedicated staff and volunteers. This wonderful legacy of the centre is continued as these protected creatures are rehabilitated and released back into the wild. Jasmine, um, a good question. Thank you so much for it. So camouflage with a giraffe is quite a difficult deal, uh, being such a large animal. But look, when they stand still, particularly in a very dense bush, and provided you can't see the back of their head, they've got almost reflective white patches on the backs of their ears, used to signal body language in their own societies. Giraffe are actually um, quite difficult to spot. Uh, but inevitably, inevitably they do have to move. They're also very heavy-footed. They've got thumping hoof, hoof steps. So they are spotted by predators. And even the adults are occasionally hunted by lions. So Owen has just, uh, has just got me to turn my shoulder at the most exquisite blood orange sky, a little bit further to my right. So I think we may leave this giraffe just to take a look at that quickly. It is superb. We're going to have to pull back a bit. And we're uh, also swapping off of uh, infrared to go back to color just to show it properly.
a wonderful glowing sunset under that very stratiform, that very flat layer cloud. Just amplifying that color as it disappears beyond our most western horizon. Now taking with it all of our daytime sightings, uh, but as, uh, as darkness sort of sneaks in, Kelly, yeah, sunsets are really phenomenal out here. There's something about viewing them under the African sky. You could take uh, a billion photos of them. And no two sunsets in any two locations on the reserve on any given afternoon are the same. The skyline is always different, constantly morphing and shaping as the clouds move. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. So I think, um, let's head over to Cedric. I can actually hear him. He must be quite close to us. Uh, let's see how his nocturnal bumble is going. <laughs> I think I might even be bumping into the dam. I think if he, most probably he's coming from Twin Dams. <laughs> I did not even know. I'm sure he is. But anyway, <laughs> well, let's just see, I'm sure. But it is, I agree, every, every sunrise, every sunset, yeah, uh, in, uh, in, this, in the bush is absolutely just so phenomenal and breathtaking. Uh, so I'll never get sick of that. I can watch every one, can take many, many a picture. But uh, coming down this side, the whole reason I'm just trying to come towards Twin Dams, Weaver Nest, uh, Weaver's Nest, that's another road that's just west of us. Um, I know that is a Veroz eagle owl that hangs around you quite a bit and I'm just trying to see if I can find the Veroz eagle owl. I'm sure that they are nesting uh, along a drainage line here uh, next to a road called Elephant Carcass. So I'm not too sure where about but uh, I'm sure because it's always between this road and the other road that we pick up on that, uh, on that owl. But let's just take a look because there is so... In a, I don't get to see them that often. The other day I saw it in this tree. Uh, I don't see anything there now. There's so many little, little night critters that we try and look for. It. And I'm just, especially on a beautiful evening like this, I've got a feeling that we might be lucky. Maybe with a Janet. I'd love to see a Janet this evening. If you are a wild earth explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of Explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colours, a very useful tote bag or even a cap. For those in the Southern Hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. Head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. Hukamori. Oh, he is an impressive looking male leopard. Look at that neck on him. He just looks ready for a fight. This is only the third time that we are seeing him that is known as the Hukumuri male. And he certainly has a lot of character and atmosphere. This is gorgeous. Hukumuri having a drink at one of the little seasonal pans. Isn't he absolutely gorgeous? Compact, powerful, focused. I love it. Cindy, good uh, evening. Well, it depends on some different owls uh, build at different places. Um, if you look, look at the Veroz eagle owl, the Veroz eagle owl sometimes even uses banks like uh, they had the Veroz eagle owl, um, the pair that actually used to nest just on the banks of, uh, of uh, the Molawati, like a, a sandbank 
and it had like a little lip and they actually made that a, a little nesting site for them. Um, as well, I've seen uh, hummercorps, uh, a hummercorp nest being actually utilized by, uh, uh, of course, an owls coming up around there and actually nesting on top of hummercorps uh, nests. Now, hummercorps nests are those big uh, nests that they just continuously build. And I'll actually kind of use that as a nesting site. So, yeah, I mean, the barn owls, you know, barn owls, they'll pretty much use uh, sometimes the roofs of the houses and on top of on attics and all that. So yeah, that's just a, many a place they've used. And spotted eagle owls. There's a nice uh, nest. Well, you can't really, well, you can't call it a nest, but it's uh, nestled in a, uh, a little kopi. The kopi is like a little mountain, like a rocky area, a rocky crop, uh, outcrop. And um, they've actually made a little nest in between the rocks and under a nice, like a little, uh, I can say, a face of the rocks and all that. And just made a nice little nesting site in there. That's a spotted eagle owl. So every owl's got their own little uh, areas that they do uh, make their uh, nests. And of course, a lot of them in hollowed out trees. So many times you get those hollowed out trees. Uh, I think it's uh, your wood owl. So those wood owls will actually have a nice nest, or not even a nest, like a hole in a nice big uh, dead tree, a hollowed out tree, and they'll actually use that as a nesting site. So yeah, just shows you it's all different kinds, different areas, different for different species. It all depends on uh, you know what they feel that's uh, safe uh, for them, in the safest area. But yeah, I'm just taking a look. Oh, I've got some eyes here. What eyes? What eyes do I have here? Ah, uh, that's Impala eyes. Sorry, sorry, Impala. Don't mean to spotlight you there. Of course, a little bit of a green reflection compared to if you look at your lion, your leopard eyes, uh, the reflection of their eyes uh, is, gives you more of that orange, yellowish orange reflection uh, due to their kind of uh, the crystal reflectors behind their pupils that'll actually give you that uh, funny color uh, where it'll find uh, if it's your wildebeest or your impala, steenbok, it'll have a bit of a green, bluish uh, reflection uh, from these spotlights. to eat, get their fill in there as well. But they're also gonna be told off. See, it's, lions are not great at sharing their food. Okay, guys, let me just take in frustration out on the other lion, but you see, it was interesting. So we are uh, approaching Weaver's Nest. So I think I'm going to go up slowly up Weaver's Nest. I'm not lucky for all, all that owl around uh, Twin Dam's side. So let's try Weaver's Nest because I know there is a little section where we sometimes see that rose eagle owl in this area. Well, we'll continue with up uh, Weaver's Nest and uh, continue searching. Let's see what uh, Liam's up to and see where he is. So uh, we have got uh, a pretty cool sighting of a large bird. Speaking of large birds, up here 
safely undisturbed by our infrared light. Did you get any of that com? No. Yes, still heading up on a weaver's nest. Oh, is that a chameleon? No, it's not. There's not. Anything this side? Sometimes I look for the little, maybe a pearl spotted owlet or a little barred owlet. Those are little small owls. They are very cute. But this is, this is where I usually see that uh, rose eagle. Nothing here. Okay. Come on, little ones. Come out. Oh, yeah, towards tree house. Oh, what is that? Are we happy? Have we got it? No, nothing there. Oh, what a fantastic day again. What a lovely, lovely sunset drive. I almost said sunrise. Sunset drive. Great elephants, I'm happy all uh, Chris has picked up on uh, on that uh, herd of elephants that he tracked down, which is fantastic. Well done, old Chris. And of course, Liam, some beautiful zebras around Simbambili clearing. Well, I think those are really stunning. Uh, and of course, uh, the clumber and cubs. So I think I've just got a, a little spotted thick knee on the road. Oh, and he's flown off. Okay, he's gone. With birds, we tend not to put any lights on them, I uh, feel, because especially when they start flying, I don't want to blind them. And uh, hopefully they don't go and fly into a, into a tree or get disorientated somehow, which would be a, a disastrous. All right. Mm, nice, fresh elephant dung, yeah. Fresh elephant dung. Yes, definitely. Oh, fantastic. That will be a fantastic. A last uh, minute leopard I would be very, very over the moon about. Oh, a pangolin. How about that? A last minute pangolin. That would be even better. <laughs> All Wild Earth Explorers have a chance to join our naturalists in a monthly fireside chat. This is a great way to learn more about our guides, animal characters and wildlife locations. We would love to hear from you as to the topics that interest you the most. Email us your ideas or tweet using the hashtag WildEarth and we will be sure to take them into account when planning our evenings around the fire in the future. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Look at that, look at that, there's a tiny, tiny leopard cub. Karula has given birth overnight. Look at the little guy who just came around the corner. That is incredible, that's probably his first solo kill. Oh, that is wonderful. I oh, have a look, here comes Osana with the monitor lizard. So Osana, of course, at the same time decided to go climbing up the tree. He's just nearly fallen out of it again. Yeah, look at that, he's running away. The buffalo is chasing Osana at the moment.
All right, so I'm just uh, nestled up here on the dam wall at True House Dam. And uh, I'm just coming just to admire this uh, beautiful sky that we do have here tonight. Really, it looks like there's a huge fire in the background, but of course that is just the sun that has been setting behind the Drakensberg mountain range. You can just see a little bit of the reflection coming off the water, but that sky is on fire. Just gonna listen out a little bit. Slinky, uh, that's correct. That's the one. Eh? That's that one that's got a very like kind of a tawny uh, color, nice uh, uh, kind of a very light face and uh, a little bit of speckles. And it's actually when it flies by, many times you'll actually hear like a, squ a squeak, it's not a squeak, <laughs> a squeak, <laughs> like, a, like a, a shrilling noise, like Cree! like yeah, very, like not the nicest of uh, sounds, but it is exactly, a barn owl is a non owl. Very correct. I actually love that name, a non owl. I think it's, uh, I don't know what Noniki means, but it sounds like it sounds like it fits that owl. Noniki owl. I'm just listening out. I'm just hoping we get a, a whoop or two from the Juma clan. While we sit here a little bit longer, I just want to listen out for anything that's maybe going to be calling and gives us an idea where to go. Uh, I think let's head back to Liam and see how it's going on his night bumble. Uh, hello again. Uh, sorry about uh, sort of losing you there in that uh, Batelier sighting. We had a slight technical difficulty, but we are all good again. Um, anyway, the batelier flew off, <laughs> and so did we. So the uh, the search for uh, nocturnal stuff continues. Interesting that in this cool weather, we're not seeing so many chameleons in the red bushwillow woodland, where uh, they're normally very plentiful. You know, they're obviously still here. They don't go underground or anything like that. Uh, but perhaps just moving into spots where they're um, a little bit warmer, a bit more protected. Uh, even stuff like uh, the odd nightjar and the odd scrub hair seem to be a bit thin on the ground uh, this evening. Probably something to do with uh, the cool, cool temperatures. Uh, but there is life out there. In the woodlands of Juma lives a lion pride with a taste for buffalo. Look, 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 this is insane. Now, this is what I was saying about lions and buffalo. It's absolute pandemonium. Wild Earth have been privileged to follow the Nkuhuma pride for many years. One of the most loved cats in the pride is Amber Eyes. She was not successful in rearing her first two litter of cubs and was seen as an aunt to the other youngsters. Then eventually, towards the end of August 2019, we found her with four tiny cubs of her own. I'm not going to come too close because I know you got your babies. And hello you old friend. Isn't she spectacular? Oh look, this is too special. She's such a fantastic mother. Look at that, isn't that incredible? making a nice loop we are approaching the uh, Mulwati drainage line again 
uh, feeling strong catabatic forces as cool air settles in the dip. Uh, Mufasa, thank you very much for your question. Um, indeed, indeed, rather, um, there are uh, cheetah in the Sabi sand and uh, cheetah in the Greater Kruger. Um, not thousands, I think um, probably somewhere between 150 and about 200 individuals spread across um, probably 2,000 square kilometers, so they are difficult to find. Uh, but I have certainly seen cheetah in the western sector of the Sabi sand, in the south. Uh, chatting to Owen about it a little bit earlier today, he's seen them uh, here on Biffelsuk Cutline, um, up in the north. Uh, but look, with this habitat being so favorable for uh, the local leopard, um, and uh, hosting such a population of hyena and lion as well, those three species are the ultimate enemies um, of a cheetah. Uh, the cheetah, in spite of being uh, blisteringly fast, um, has in an evolutionary sense sacrificed all of its strength in exchange for streamlining. And um, what that means is it's virtually unable to defend itself from all of the other predators. And uh, they are annihilated by lion, leopard, hyena. So they just don't do all that well here. If we do see one, it tends to be passing through. Yeah, thanks for your question, Mufasa. Darcy Miller, I like your thinking. A last minute honey badger would be pretty super. Uh, my very good friend and um, fellow naturalist um, working an earlier stint here at uh, Wild Earth, Kelly, Kelly Oldacre, and Owen actually had a, a wonderful sighting of a honey badger fairly recently. So it is well within the realm of possibility. Yeah, that is a seriously cantankerous and formidable uh, little, uh, little mammal. Africa's answer to uh, the Northern Hemisphere's wolverine. Sophia, good evening. Um, thanks very much for uh, sending your question in to me. Um, it's great to have you watching. So uh, the honey badger is absolutely called um, the honey badger because he likes to eat honey. You've got that, uh, you hit that nail right on the head, you've got it right. Um, so they love to eat honey. They've got uh, really thick leathery skin which protects them from the, the stings of very aggress aggressive uh, honey bees. Obviously once that badger starts tearing into the um, hive with its powerful claws, it uh, whips the bees into a fury. They start stinging it all over the place. Um, now he's, he's got a reputation for having an immunity to um, a lot of venom, even a bite from a snake. Um, he probably, uh, probably will survive. Uh, but the only place that a bee can really get him is right on the tip of his nose. So a badger that is tunneling into a beehive will actually um, get his nose nice and dirty. He'll hopefully dip it in a bit of sand and maybe that'll offer a bit of protection from the bees. But they love it. Honey and uh, bee larvae, which will also be living in there. And he will munch all of that stuff up with, uh, with relish, with great excitement. My favorite thing about Wild Earth are the animals and the interaction and the ability to wait and watch and not rush off you get to watch their behavior and learn about it, the individuals. I would like to see the hyenas at the hyena den, and I have. There they are. Look at that. <laughs> if I could be any animal, I would be a cheetah. I would love to run fast. 
Our Western Cape coastline is graced with a Cape fur seal. This playful species is curious and entertaining. At Hout Bay Seal Rescue Centre, seals in need are rescued, fed and nursed back to health by our well-trained team of dedicated staff and volunteers. This wonderful legacy of the centre is continued as these protected creatures are rehabilitated and released back into the wild. It is a peaceful, tranquil, quiet night here on Juma. So I think um, let's head over to Cedric now to see, uh, see what he hopes to sniff out before we have to head home. Yeah, no, definitely. It is a peaceful, quiet night, which is uh, very, very interesting, very nice. Very kind of fresh tonight. It's lovely. I love it. Like a fresh air that's coming through, like a chilly, fresh feel to the night. But yeah, funny that, uh, as I said, those chameleons have uh, really disappeared now. We don't even hardly even see one in the tree. It would be nice just to pick one chameleon and see it. It's like, oh, oh. Oh, okay. Don't worry, almost uh, instead of picking, uh, finding a chameleon, I found a, a branch. Uh, just want to quickly see if I can move this branch out of the way here. Yeah? Sorry about that. Uh, I'm just going to reverse. Uh, okay, come with me, branch. Let's go out this way. There we go. And uh, there we go. Some uh, the gym work for the evening. Uh, especially my one arm, my right arm's always been so sore, my shoulder. I've always had, because I used to play a lot of, uh, we were just talking about uh, sports now with Eagle, and uh, I used to play a lot of cricket and uh, tennis. So I think with all those years of bowling and, uh, and of course, the racket and bowling uh, the cricket ball, um, I ended up with a thing called a bicep tenderitis, almost like a rotator cuff uh, injury. So sometimes even holding a torch for a long period, I start getting a uh like almost like a frozen shoulder but it's fine it's all good it's uh i need that prayer exercise but on top of that to the more of a serious note i think uh what i would love to see tonight is uh i think uh, i just want to see a pangolin again i I've, i haven't i've only seen three in my uh, three in my 16 years i've only seen three pangolins and i would love to bump into another one uh, somewhere along the line and I think uh, I've got a feeling sooner or later our luck will change and I can get to find one so yes but also earlier I'm talking about the cheetahs I agree I said the cheetahs have been very much uh, scarce around this area there's not those big open clearings uh, around this uh, this area for the cheetahs to really kind of uh, uh, utilize I think it's I remember, I think, uh, when Liam was, and myself, we were both uh, working in the western area of the Sabi Sands and uh, down there in the south, southwest, the place of Vanna, very big open clearings and always found cheat to that side. If you are a wild earth explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colours a very useful tote bag, or even a cap. For those in the Southern Hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. Head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. My heart rate has gone up slightly. In fact, it's gone up quite a lot. This elephant is now two meters from us. Okay, we might have to move here. No? Yes. Sorry, my friend, but you're about to push that onto the car. <laughs> you see how cross he was that we didn't want to watch him push the key over. That's why we moved. <laughs> I 
Okay. So heading towards, uh, as I said, to Zoe's site, and um, I'm thinking maybe, maybe we're lucky. I'll get a TP or Toto Spain coming down there, or you never know, or Tavang, Tavangumi. That would be a nice uh, surprise. Uh, Sharon, good evening. What survival skills are leopards born with? Well, I think Sharon, first of all. Um, climbing trees. I think from a very young age they can already climb uh, uh, little trees, small thin trees. So if hyenas or lions do come close, um, those little leopards can uh, maneuver themselves very quickly up a very small uh, branch or uh, shrub tree. And uh, that is definitely one of the main survival skills that they do have. Um, I remember uh, well, many years ago, Hell Shadow, once again, Hell Tandy's sister, there on Arethusa driveway, we still had uh, uh, two of her little cubs. Uh, they're on the driveway, it's close to the airstrip area. And then all of a sudden we had uh, a pride of lions, I think it was, a, I can't remember, I think it was a Styx pride that was walking down uh, the driveway. And those cubs were very small, they were about maybe uh, two months old, if, about two months. And of course, uh, once those lions did approach Shadow and those two little cubs, uh, those uh, little, little cubs climbed up a Tamboiti tree. And uh, this Tamboiti tree was the most flimsiest looking tree that you can see on the entire driveway. And they climbed this uh, Tamboiti tree and they got right to the top, but they, they, they kind of stayed on that tree very, very still, with the branch a little bit like kind of bending with their weight. And, uh, well, they got away from the lions, and lions did not see them at all. So it just shows you that's a, a very important skill that uh, little leopard cubs are uh, born with. Ooh, let's uh, head to Liam. I think he's just found something, or found an animal that he's been looking for. So um, I believe this is uh, one of the species Cedric was hoping to see tonight. Um, this was quite a lucky spot. We're going to leave the challenge up to you for uh, um, a good couple of seconds there on your screen. So in this little round leaf tick bush or in its surrounds, can you see the animal that we are looking for? It's perhaps a little bit challenging. So we'll give you a chance to have a bit of a look around there. Uh, we'll make it a bit easier. We'll uh, tell you that the animal that we are looking for is a chameleon. <laughs> so you know we're looking for a chameleon, but uh, where exactly it is, that's uh, sort of the aim of a chameleon's game, I guess. Okay, so if the anticipation is killing you, let us put you out of your misery. Owen is going to zoom in nicely on him, as close as the camera can go anyway. So right in the center of screen. <laughs> Apparently everybody in our uh, final control, our main control office, um, with the exception of Gwyn, <laughs> were able, able to see this chameleon. Mm, brilliant. So, um, Odie and I cheated a little bit, admittedly, uh, we were shining our spotlight. Um, this round leaf teak is like uh, an emerald, emerald green, and this chameleon is actually the most vivid shade of, like, sunset orange. Uh, so, uh, yeah, he looked like a very funny-shaped dead leaf, and uh, that's what got me to stop. But uh, with infrared on, so that's a light that only the camera can see, the animals can't. And this chameleon is almost invisible. He's so difficult to pick out. And essentially, for a lot of uh, nocturnal predators, seeing in black and white, um, arguably, 
and he'd be just as difficult to spot. Tingana has been affectionately known as the Duke of Juma for many years, but his path to the throne was not an easy one. Mvula was a legend from the south. This is the cat that I'm pretty sure Tingana was sniffing around for. That is Mvula. How exciting is this? Eventually, Mvula lost, but his young son, Quarantine, started to push through from the east. At the beginning of 2018, an intruder arrived. His name was Hukumuri. All Wild Earth explorers have a chance to join our naturalists in a monthly fireside chat. This is a great way to learn more about our guides, animal characters and wildlife locations. We would love to hear from you as to the topics that interest you the most. Email us your ideas or tweet using the hashtag WildEarth and we will be sure to take them into account when planning our evenings around the fire in the future. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Yeah, so total masters of camouflage, these little chameleons. Um, and our, our, our only species of chameleon that occurs indigenously, indigenously in the Greater Kruger and the Sabi Sands. Now, thanks very much, Harper, for your, uh, your comment there. That was a, a lucky spot, a nice one. Um, yeah, I've often had people on safari when uh, myself or the tracker in the past has picked out a chameleon and pointed it out. People are just in disbelief. They think it's a plastic one and that you've, uh, you've gone before afternoon drive and hung it up in the tree. And people cannot believe until its little eye opens that uh, it's actually a living thing <laughs> and that we've managed to spot it sleeping on a branch. There's a bit of a trick to it, though, and once you've... Um, seen enough of them you know what to look for uh, but i love it love a little chameleon and um, he's got no external ears um, he senses vibration um, so uh, he hasn't picked up on us at all his eyes closed he's fast asleep nice uh, nice that we're getting such a good view of him and not even disturbing him from his sleep Suddenly a bit of a cool breeze blowing in, uh, perhaps a little bit uh, of cloud coming with it, but I don't know. The sky looks pretty crystal clear to me. So it's, it's almost time to uh, wrap up the show for the evening, but um, from Owen and myself, it's been uh, the most phenomenal pleasure to guide you um, at least some of the way uh, with my colleagues Cedric and uh, Chris as well. Um, yeah, we hope you've enjoyed the show. Have a wonderful night uh, wherever you are. And we really hope to have you along for the adventure tomorrow morning again. Viewer discretion is advised.